the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio host, and nationally recognized safety expert, Dr. David Perotti. Join us each week as we discuss the best and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. Follow Dr. Perotin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe. Hey, everybody. It is your good friend, Dr. David Perotin. A little bit of a hot mic here, so uh, I move it back. Uh, <laughs> welcome, welcome. It is the 25th of August, 2022, and I was a guest on John Crump Live this afternoon in what I think was one of my best interviews in a long time. Um, first of all, John and, and Flying Rich always put together great content, but uh, so really uh, covered a lot of stuff in an, in an hour, specific to the Safer um, Communities Bill and the impact it's going to have on schools and kind of some of the glaring omissions from that bill. But not to rehash that, we already kind of talked about that on a previous show here. But um, I think th presenting today on John's show, it was you know really concise down to those points. And I had a little bit of time to kind of stew and to think about those. Hey, it's Bolo. Welcome to our good friend Bolo. Shout out right here. Bolo. I'm going to upgrade my... Uh, software. Hey, it's our good friend, John Rice. Um, I'm going to upgrade. Yeah, so I think I can uh, do some real time filtering of like the light. Like right now, it looks like a, a, like it's really, it is kind of bright in here, but I'm a little bit uh, over. This is a little bit over lit, but that's the software effect that's, that's happening here. So, um, but yeah, so far, you know, the Windows up, the Windows 10 upgrade I did earlier this summer has really worked out well. I haven't had any issues uh, with that. So um, the office where I'm at, so to my left, it's Toy Town. Wow, everybody's here. This is awesome. So thanks. Thanks for the thumbs up and for, for watching. And I appreciate it. Um, in my my office, my to the left, so this is in a, my basement in my house. And uh, last year, I started kind of the serious, <laughs> I, I don't know if it'd be renovation, but it was taking it from an office in a basement to more of a professional setting. Um, and I'll do some things in the back, right back here. And I might, you know, green screen that for some of the stuff I do. But um, but yeah, I, I had the, the carpet replaced with, hardwood floor, which was a big, big increase of uh, professionalism. And, and uh, the uh, the carpet was old. It was down here. And now I've got kind of the rollerblade wheels on. I can move around. But uh, to my left, though, it was, you know, just a regular uh, wall, you know, and over the years, you know, had remnants of hangers for shelves and stuff like that. So um, had that wall um, redone. We worked on it to you know patch it up and to paint it and i'm going to bring up an, an image right now of it and tell you um kind of what you're what you're looking at you're like it's a wall i'm like you're right it is a wall um but, but let's let me share that with you because it's a kind of special story with this okay so this is what is to my left that is that is on my left right now. So I could almost go out and, and touch um, those paintings. So these are three paintings um, from the 1960s from New Mexico. Um, and these three paintings, so I will go a little bit bigger here. Um, these are three oil paintings, and they belonged to my... Um, Godfather and my aunt. And when they had passed away, um, these paintings eventually became mine. They, and I had wanted to display, display these for a long time. And it I remember where they were when they had them in their house and the stories that they would tell about these paintings. And, um, and finally, uh, by having this wall done, so the wall on the left is actually like a peach, kind of a very light orange. Um, it, doesn't quite show up in this picture, but uh, so it looks really nice. And we paint it so the pictures would would be highlighted by the wall, right? So it wasn't just taking pictures on a wall. It was like, well, how are we going to 
here's the pictures we want on this wall. So what are we going to color? You know, paint this wall. In? So here's the three. You know, these are yeah all from the 1960s. Uh, these were I think two are the same, and one is is different with a local artist in New Mexico who who did uh, New Mexico. Uh, Tucumera. This is the countryside by uh, Tucumera, Mexico, uh, New Mexico, I should say. So anyway, it's it's, it's a special thing. Uh, it's cool to have that down here. And uh, otherwise, it used to be like all kinds of sports things that I had up and I don't have any of the sports stuff down here anymore. So, um, so let me get rid of that. So it's Chris is not here. Uh, Chris, Robert is running the uh, zero weight uh, full synthetic oil. So yeah, so way to go. I I was uh, the hero this this week because my neighbors, Robert, across the road, I, I so I was sitting out at the end of the day and I'm in um, my my lawn chair, you know, my driveway. And they're out there with like a, a hand snippers trying to like cut the, the weeds that have grown up in their cracks and trying to edge their, their driveway and stuff with, with like hand, hand shears. And I'm like, I'm watching it and I'm like, you know what, like, um, I'm going to do, I'm going to help them out. Right. Because this will take forever and I don't even know if they'll be able to do it. So I have a 20 year old that I bought new, um, Briggs and Stratton, uh, four stroke weed whacker. So it's like a 70 pound beast. I mean, <laughs> this thing is a monster and, uh, I, they, I mean, you can't get anything like this today. And I always do full synthetic oil, you know, Robert in because, and I change it out on a pretty regular basis. Cause what it, you know, takes, you know, like two thimbles of oil, um, but otherwise, you know, you can overheat that and and, uh, and cook it. So that's why I always use full synthetic. And and again, to, an oil change on that is almost ridiculous because it's just a, a tiny amount of, of oil. But and I run True Fuel, uh, full synthetic gasoline, so I don't have any carb issues. But uh, so I go and and walk over there, right? And I've uh, and I said, hey, like, just let me help you out. Let me. Um, it'll, it'll take me 10, 15 minutes tops. And then like, you can, you'll, you'll still have stuff to do. You'll have to sweep everything up. But I'm like, you know, just, and they had, had the kids, you know, they're, they're young. I'm like, just keep the kids inside. So, you know, they're not walking around while I'm doing this and it's kicking up a, a lot of dust. But anyway, I went over and, and they were like, they were thankful. And they said, uh, uh, sure. And I, and I did say, I said, this is it's just fun for me. Like I love using this thing and, and, you know, and actually it, I should use it a run it a little bit hotter here for a while to, to kind of run through some gas and stuff. So, um, I went out there and man, um, things look awesome over there. And one of our other neighbors from across the road, when I was all done, he came over and he's like, Oh my God, like your place looks great. I mean, cause I don't know if it had been done for like a year or two. So like I trimmed and trimmed it all along the curb. Like I just, and the next day, another neighbor with adjoining property went out and like did his, I, you know, you kind of get this motivation when, when people, spend a little time making their property look good or mow their lawn. Some you know, other people do it, but yeah, it really, it really was cool. But when I walked away and back to my house across the road, like their whole house was just under this cloud of dust from everything, like kicking that up with the, with the weed whacker, but uh, looks great. And yeah, it's the kind of neighbor I want to be right. Like um, I want to, I want to be that person where they're like, oh yeah, you know, that guy helped us out. You know, the one time we, and it, it was one of those things too, because they were already doing that. It's different, right? If I just go over and, and do that, they'd be like, well, what's this guy doing over here working on our yard? And, but, you know, I actually, I saw them struggling for, you know, 20, 30 minutes on this. And I'm like, you know, if, if that was me and I was doing it and I didn't have, you know, the equipment, you know, which was the, the weed whacker and stuff, I would, I would hope somebody would, would kind of be like, yeah, I'll come over and help you out. So, um, anyway, that, that was a good thing. That was a, that was a good, I, I kind of thought I was a little bit on the fence of, because I didn't want to like come off of like, Oh, like, you know, I'm, I'm going, yeah, your property could use a little tune up and, and I don't know. I, it's one of those things you never know today of how people kind of take things. But again, because they had started in and, and I just said, you know, it's, um, this, I could cut your work down to 15 minutes on this. And it's really fun for me to, uh, to get to use this monster here. So, so, uh, thanks Robert. Yeah. I, I mean, I think I've, I'm fortunate to live in an area where we have, um, a, a good neighbor network, right. Of, 
helping people out, especially when we get the snows here, which, you know, not too far away, maybe three months. So, yeah. Hey, thanks, Polo. Um, and uh, Chris is here. Yeah, maintenance maintenance is is everything. I mean, my, my mower is almost 20 years old. My weed whacker is 20. My snowblower I bought in 2008. Just, you know, everything's great because, yeah, changing the oil. And I took my snowblower out uh, maybe a month or two ago, and I had a little bit of rust that was forming on it. So I treated that and and uh, got it all painted and touched up. So everything is good. Um, so yeah, one. So I had a, a terrific interview um, today on uh, John Crump Live. So if you want to uh, check that out sometime, it's about an hour long. Uh, but I am preparing right now for the classes that I teach in person in fall at the university. And um, I'm in the very last step of getting things ready. So there's actually a lot that goes into getting the fall classes ready. You have to, the university issues a new syllabus formats and whatever you have, you have to like adapt it to the new format. And, and then there's a, it's in person, but there's also an online component, a Moodle component. And so you have to put all your resources in Moodle and make sure everything links out and people can link to it in class. And it just takes a lot of time to, to build this. It's, it's, um, back when I first taught, you know, I don't know, 20, no, my first class I taught was in fall of 2003. I literally had a milk carton crate and it would be for every day of class that I would teach. So if class met, you know, 10 days during a semester, like they were night classes or 12 or whatever, I would have 12 crates in the room next to me. And this would be the crate for the first class because there were usually materials to hand out and stuff. So, yeah, so this is a lot better, but, um, so I'm in, in, in the last phase, but I, I have one case study that I share in my classes. I actually have more than that, but I've, I, we do a lot of case study work. It's, I think it really helps people um, learn when you can frame things out in, in a, through case studies. But anyway, um, I have one case study that I use in all of my classes. I teach aspiring school leaders, so superintendents, principals, um, and this always splits people right down the middle, always. So the way, first of all, and I'm going to go through it with you here. It, it's not very long. Um, and, you know, it, and it might seem to you probably straightforward, right? Whatever your position is, people usually don't fence sit on this. They immediately go to a yes or no. It's It asks yes or no at the end, this case study. Again, it's not very long. Um, it's This is something that actually has happened in our state, happens across the country on a pretty regular basis. So again, I'll, I'll get into this in a little bit. Um, but this gets at the question of professional discretion, right? So do you feel that you have professional discretion? Like if you're a school administrator, that your school board has given that to you, they'd have your back, right? Unconditionally that you are making the um, best choice at that moment, right? And even if it goes south, like they're saying he had the best or she had the best information at the time and and made the call. Or would you be would would you be the person that would say, no, um, this doesn't match with our board of education policy. I haven't been trained in this, so I'm not going to do this. This is kind of abstract. It'll make sense in a little bit. This single case study um, will instantly calibrate people. You, you'll measure where people are at for discretion. You'll find the people who, if something goes wrong, right, they're going to try to go up to administration, try to get validated before they make a decision. And there's not necessarily something wrong with that, but you're going to find out or people will learn themselves. Like, do I really have discretion to make a tough call or don't I? What do I believe? Or what is what is my staff, the people that work for me, what do they believe? Um, so this is a good way to, to figure that out because a lot of what happens in uh, school safety is people um, struggle with using their disc discretion, right? They don't know, um, hey, should I act, if it's an intruder, right? Do I have professional discretion to activate a fire alarm or, or a or uh, intruder alarm. I had somebody um, once tell me that they 
would be hesitant to use an AED in the hallway, a defibrillator, because they knew that the pads on it were very expensive. I don't know, like a hundred dollars or something like that. So if you used it, like there was this cost because actually I had written about that in a uh, newsletter or something when I was an administrator of like, we had just replaced these, they only last so long. And uh, it was crazy. Um, it was it was really crazy. But also you could tell that person, they would, they would probably go ahead and use it, but in the back of their mind, they think, oh God, like now there's an expense with this. Be because no one told them explicitly, like, use the device, right? Use it. And it, in schools, you get into this with, like, EpiPens and kids. Um, hey, Andrew and uh, Agorizer, welcome. Um, so this is, it's also common with, like, EpiPens. So an uh, epinephrine pen, if you have an allergic reaction to peanuts or shellfish or whatever it is, um, kids will have these in schools and once, so if they start to show, you know, swelling in their, their face, hard time breathing, if you use that pen, the auto injector, right, the EpiPen, you know, EpiPen's not cheap, 100 bucks at least. Um, if you use that, it's done, right? The moment you use the pen, um, you have to call 911 because that buys you so much time, the epinephrine and, and, and now, so you know, like if you use this pen, the office will be calling 911. The parents will be called. The kid might be transported, you know, to the hospital. I mean, all this stuff is going to happen. Now, there are, there was a district um, not too far from me where a parent came to the school board meeting and started to contact school board members and said, you know, the school had used an EpiPen maybe a couple times with her student during, I don't know if it was a year, a school year, or um, but you know, you, usually that doesn't happen, but in this case it did happen. And, and the parents said every time, you know, uh, the kid gets taken to the hospital and there's this uh, expense and, and, uh, I want the school to call me and I will come and I'll make an assessment on the child. And part of the pe people on the board were kind of listening to that. And they were, they came back to the, the superintendent and the soup's like, no, no way. Right. Like if, if. The, if imagine we try to do this and the parent comes in, first of all, does the parent get there in time? The parent is making a decision they're not medically qualified to, to make, right? If this child should go to the doctor, or even if the parent says, I'll take the doctor, take the child to the doctor. Um, you know, you have that, the, what happens then if the child, um, the parent can't monitor the child as the parent is driving. What if the child's condition deteriorates? Then they have to call nine one one and interface with the ambulance. So, all these things. But these are these things are these things happen, right? I mean, these these things happen. So hey, it's a uh, gunmetal guy USA. Hey, buddy, keep pushing in. You back? Um. So this is this is really where these decisions have to be made, and you have to be swift and decisive. And that's where this case study comes in. And you'll find people who are not swift and decisive. And it's, I don't think, right, I, I'm not saying this is this is a flaw in a person. I think it can very much be a flaw in a system where they haven't been told, like, I've got your back. If you use this EpiPen, if you use the AED or what we're going to talk about here in a second, I've got your back. So if this is what you do, yeah, and, so, and also like as a person saying, I, I did the, uh, the, I'm laminated to context and time. I made the best decision I could in the moment and anything, you know, I find out afterwards, I don't know. Um, so let's go. Heath is saying, Hey, remember the old bond films when they use, now? I remember those. Why not just knock everyone out? If, if it's safe, I don't know. Oh my goodness. Um, so guy, I'm going to go through this, uh, this case study. And I do have a couple slides here to go with it. So let me get those up. So this all kind of makes sense. So I just got to move. I have three screens in front of me. Um, yes, this is only a four slide PowerPoint, by the way. These are all off of Pixabay free to use. So, um, all right, so let's do this. And then I'm going to pause and have you guys answer yes or no. 
for like, you know, what, what you would do. And then I'll tell you how, you know, again, people will split how they respond on this and I'll tell you why they, how they defend their position. Right. So, well, you know, why'd you do that? So let's, um, this is, again, I'll be, I'll be doing this one, um, in a couple of weeks in my classes. So let's get over and do this, um, share screen. No. Um, stop screen, share screen, share and over here. Okay. So you've got this, this image. So, all right, here we go. Here is the scenario. All right. And it's four slides and then we've got to make it, we've got to make some decisions. Here's a scenario. Um, afternoon recess is ending at a rural elementary school in your school district. So what you are doing right now, gunmetal guy, Bolo, Heath, um, Robert, Agrizer, Andrew, you are going to assume, right, that you are the principal, okay, or the person in charge of a rural elementary school, school like out in the sticks. Okay, that is your, you're assuming that role right now. Okay, so here we are. It's afternoon. Uh, recess is ending. As students line up to enter the school, a recess aide is unable to account for Bryce. Bryce is a fourth grade student with autism. He is nonverbal and will consistently respond or to, or I should say, and he will not consistently respond to someone calling him by name, okay? So recess is ending. Bryce is a fourth grade student with autism and they can't find him. Has anyone seen Bryce? Two students said that Bryce was with some classmates at the end of the playground, right? There you kind of see playground. They were getting big sticks from the woods to build a fort, okay? Bryce, Bryce, the recess aides call for Bryce to no avail. They immediately inform the office and building principal that Bryce has likely wandered away from the school and into the nearby woods. There's a river a quarter mile away. The principal directs the secretary to call 911 and then convenes a group of staff to begin to search for Bryce. The school does not have a protocol for searching for a lost student. Due to its rural location, it could take several minutes for police or fire personnel to arrive. The principal is on the playground dispatching staff in directions to search for Bryce. Suddenly, an unfamiliar man with a large suitcase runs onto the playground and toward the principal. He doesn't appear threatening, but he is anxious. I will help search for the boy, he states. The man who lives next to the school heard the law student call on his police scanner. He states that he is a proficient drone operator and can have his drone in the air within one minute. He puts down his case and retrieves what appears to be a high-end drone. He shares that his drone has a real-time camera and GPS coordinates. What do you do? Do you accept his offer? Okay. So that's it. That's a case study. Do you, you're the principal. Um, do you accept his offer to use this drone? So what do you think? What do you put it down there? What do you, what do you think? What would you do? Bolo, Gunmetal USA, would you accept the, the offer to use the drone in the search for this missing student? So is saying, yep, fly, drone man. Um, Andrew is 100% accept. Heath, no, stranger danger. Look for the kid yelling out his favorite food or color. Bolo, no, Bolo saying no, wouldn't accept. Um, anybody, anybody else? Okay. Um... Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? 
What do we have? Uh, David K. I work in a school setting. I would have to say no. Okay. All right. So we have, we, we are, this is exactly what happens in every um, class uh, that I teach superintendents, principals, um, directors of special education. It is largely a 50 50 split. Yes, no. Yes, no. All bunch of privacy laws. So, so and, and David is making um, the argument very well already for the people who go on the no side. So do you accept the offer? Yes or no. So um, here's here's what people will say on the, the yes side, right? And then I'll tell you how I would respond to this as a school administrator. Um, but on the yes side, people be like, absolutely. Like it's a tool. Um, it, you know, even if, Every minute counts. We know there's water nearby. And also, there. I mean, if you really get into an argument of why you'd want to use all tools, this is the book Lost Person Behavior. Um, and this Robert um, Koster has, has gone through and people with autism, right? Kids with autism, people with dementia, and people who are young or, or you know, old or unfamiliar with an area. Here's typically what they do if they're, if they're lost or wandering. I mean, it's a phenomenon. It's actually kind of done as a handbook. It just looks all kind of washed out there, but the percentages of how far they'll go and how much time, and if they'll go toward water or machinery, but like no one in schools kind of talks about this, but if you have a student like Bryce who might wander or has any history of wandering from a school, uh, you'd want to, you'd want to brush up on lost person behavior. So, so anyway, the yes side of it, the yes argument is is I had to make make the call. We have to get it, all resources available if we're able to find the the student. Um, right, we might prevent um, injury or death to the student if they if they get toward the water. Um, so that is that is really the compelling argument, right? That this is life and death. This is another tool. It's a tool we don't have. We have really no idea who's going to be coming, when they're going to be coming. Um, we're going to use it. And they'll say, I believe my principal will have my back. I believe my board of education will have my back. I believe if there's some reason I'm, you know, sued on this, like that a fact finder, which would be like a judge, right, would have my back of saying, there's something right in, in the courts, I forget the, the exact term, but it's kind of like the, the lesser of two evils, right? You didn't have this person go through a background check and, and vet them and all of that. But like, um, if you didn't use this, was the light, was the likelihood higher that there would be harm to the student, like versus bringing this, this drone in now there could, so that's, that's the compelling argument. It's life and death. Like this person can, can get on board with this. Um, now the no side of this is, as he said, people people say, well, listen, like, you know, they 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 immediately kind of dig into the legal and the policy stuff. It's not in our policy to have somebody from outside help us. This could be a, a fine from the FAA. Like, we're giving a stranger a description of Bryce. Like, are we going to bring out a picture of Bryce or a description? Of, and, and they're going to be seeing they'll he'll love images possibly of Bryce. What if Bryce is injured or killed, right? This person now has this image that is streaming from their drone to, you know, the, the camera that's on their controller. Um, so it's kind of, you know, like the Kobe Bryant stuff, almost like how, who, who has this, this information, this video, how is this video? So, so these people, you know, may make the argument in class of saying it's too risky, um, to do that. And, so, so yeah, um, Andrew is, so let's go through here. Um, Andrew or, or Agar, as they're saying, fly, get the, get, so the drone person would be under your supervision, right? Cause they would be standing out and, you know, you, somebody or the administrator, but the administrator is likely going to be, be waiting for the emergency responders, but the drone person is likely supervised by, by somebody, um, in the school, um, Andrew's saying 100% accept. Uh, Heath is saying stranger danger. Look for kids yelling out favorite food or color. Uh, Bolo saying no. Um, David, um, I work in a school setting. So, all right. Um, 
and this is, I've got to come back on this one. Um, no expectation of privacy could fly without anyone's permission anyway. So it's saying at Chrysler. So this is, you guys have done a great job with this. <laughs> I thank you. Um, because this, these are salient points. Yeah. By the way, like Kobe, um, tended to, that seemed to be like the kickoff of everything that went bad <laughs> in 2020. Right. I remember the day that, uh, his helicopter crashed and I think I went out for a run that day and it's just weird. So David has a, a question that I bring up in this case study. So as we get done with it, um, I have a, a follow-up and say, okay, um, the person that did the search was a registered sex offender. Now, no one would know that at the time, right? But um, this person was a registered sex offender. So now as a school, right, as a superintendent and the media, I mean, the media could say sexual school allows sex offender to search for student. Imagine that as a headline, right? Without any of this context. So that's where as the principal, as the superintendent, the board of education, like, are you going to um, unconditionally stand up and say, listen, like this person came over, they had this, this, you know, tool, the drone, right. To contribute to the rescue. They were supervised um, in the moment, you know, we, we deemed, and we still deem that this uh, was the best decision for us to make was to use this, to increase our likelihood of finding the student. Um, you know, and people will come back and then say, well, if you thought the student could have gone, then some, you should have had a drone and someone would have been, but you know, this is, again, this happened. It's not like this is the seventh time Bryce has wandered from, from the school, but you're, you're absolutely right on David with, with this. And what would, what would happen then? Are, would there be consequences for the school? So this is where, um, Again, it is, it's yes and, and no, and people kind of di divide and, and put their arguments together very much in the way that you're doing. Now, I talk to, when I talk to people afterwards, um, most people kind of work over toward the yes side. And part of that is because I just, I also tell them like, I think you should be on the yes side. Personally, I think this is, this, you know, is you should use this. And I've worked with people, search and rescue. I talked to a search and rescue guy. Um, who sp specifically works in drones. That's all he does is trains people in drones. And we, we had a face-to-face -face conversation a couple of weeks ago. And he's like, you know, these, these questions come up like this case study, but um, you know, the more ahead of time you can have these discussions, like what would you do if, if somebody offered this outside resource, you know, to you? Um, but yeah, this, this is pretty crazy stuff. So the, the, the thing is, um, in talking with some of these new school leaders, they'll say, you know what, like, maybe I could do that at the district I'm at now, the district I was at previously or three districts ago, like if I would have done that, I would have caught hell. <laughs> I would have, it would have been all, I wouldn't have had the support for my superintendent or my school board or, you know, the parents, no one would have, would have stood up the, um, for for me to use this, regardless of the the outcome. I mean, you could have an outcome in this where what if um, what if Bryce uh, goes to the water and drowns? And someone said, well, he was scared of the drone and the drone, you know, um, yeah, increased the likelihood he was going to go toward the water, which isn't accurate per lost person behavior. But you know, that's an argument someone could could make. And, and uh, so this this is really tricky, right? It, it's murky. It's in the moment you have to make that call. Um, are you going to have them, you know, sit on the sideline or not? And again, um, you know, this is it's, in this context is not a, it, you know, a drone isn't a very invasive thing, but a drone is going to capture again, if it's video, you're going to have to share out information with this person, what happens and, um, it, you know, and you don't have, you, you have to try to figure the moment, how's the rest of the rest of the rescue or the search going to work. Um, but, um, but yeah. So what, what I tend to find is if people are on the no part, they go back and they, they need to hash this out with the rest of their administrative team and their board, right? And say, what if this happened, right? What would we, um, what would we do? And what if it, uh, would you have our back? Like if, if this didn't work out or in there was backlash and just as, as David Kay have said, you know, what if, what if there was, you know, some, some record of, if this person has a, a background, which is, um, 
you know, something you you wouldn't otherwise approve this person to be on your on your grounds, your your school grounds. So you know, this this is this is tricky stuff. Um, but again, um, it tends to come out where people will admit that they got burned in the past in these leadership positions. And they're like, I don't want to, I either, I don't want to get burned again, or I'm still thinking back to the time I made the call. Like I had an administrator who answered no to this. And the administrator said, you know, one of the reasons I'm answering no to this is because, um, you know, one time I, I, you know, made a, a decision to, um, close school because it was, of, of snow and stuff like that. And the parents and everybody just got so mad at me. And, and then, um, uh, the, the board never, you know, said, made a statement of saying, you know, for the safety of our staff and students, the deteriorating road conditions, you know, we back a hundred percent our superintendent, you know, when they talk with the, the buildings and grounds and get information from the roads, you know, pe the people out on the roads and stuff like that, they never got validated. So they just, they just got fried. And they also at a board meeting, they were just like people were taking jabs at this person. They're like, if they're like, that was, you know, the roads were icing up and they're like to do something like this. Um, and you can you can always to an extent use policy as a shield. And there's a high immunity in school like there is nothing if this were a court case. Right. There's nothing where a lawyer could say the principal mu must use this outside resource there's that's not in any policy best interest of the student is in 60 legal cases it's defined 60 different ways literally i wrote about that in school of errors by the way which is 20 dollars, and it's now on an audiobook you can get it for 7.99 from downpour if you're on audible it's more audible marks it up but um 20 give it to a friend that's the most honest book ever written about the three billion dollar school safety industry really about five billion dollar now it's timely so, and since, since you're in the giving mood, Bolo, the philosophy of information, the uh, book about how to thrive during extended periods of chaos, which is up for the SI Hayakawa award. But, uh, um, so this is, this is a discretion question, right? And, um, people go both ways on this. And really, if you, if you fully adhere to policy, you'll, you'll, probably be okay um but was it was it the right decision was it the best decision for that situation um and i would i'll put in my bias right now in my just professional opinion you know someone who's done safety has been a school administrator i was a school administrator at the school for the blind and we we were next to a river it was literally the the building which was um uh it's a residential uh, facility, so it's all connected. It's really, really terrific place, a terrific school, by the way. But um, so you get out of the building and you walk down a hill and then there's like a football field track type area. And then like you walk down from that and you get to a city park and you walk down another, you know, 30 yards and there's a river, a pretty robust river. So, you know, a quarter mile in back of the school is, is this river. I mean, if you were to go in, in the river, especially in winter, you wouldn't make it out. Um, so, you know, what do you, what do you do here? Um, how's your decision making? Is it swift? And, um, so Bolo's, Bolo's saying the assumption is the autistic kid uh, was confused when they got lost. Maybe that person wanted to be left alone. Right. So, so forensically, like these were, these would be all things you'd, um, be analyzing and right. What if the student didn't want to be left alone? Or what in the world? Oh, all right. What if they did want to be left alone? Um, or what if this indeed was? Oh, like hey, you know, they're they're out there. They're clicking sticks. So maybe they went out a little further. Or maybe they're checking you know, stuff out. And so yeah, the, I mean, no one really really knows at this point. It's a good point, Bolo, Bolo, because maybe you know, at least you know, the student isn't running because they're upset or angry or anything maybe they were just exploring this area so maybe that indicates they're maybe working at a little bit slower pace but i don't know i mean schools don't practice for this schools don't do drills and exercises typically for what do you do for a wandering student sometimes with students who wander with autism um they will have 
basically like a GPS um, that they will. Oh, like um, so. All right. So. Are we getting better here? This is too bad. This is this is a good one. All right. So uh, what the world is going on? Okay. Uh, hang in there. Let me see if I can. Roboting some. Okay. Um, we should be back now. All right. Good. Good. We're back. We're back. So thanks. I, I don't know what happened. So um, anyway, um, so so as you can see, thanks, Andrew. Thank, um, so yeah, I tell you, right to go with Netflix. It's probably my, my daughter downloading something, I'm guessing, but I don't know. We're connected and there's a lot of people on this uh, charter line. So, but uh, um, this is, it seems like it's a straightforward case study. Whether you go yes or no, it seems like it's pretty straightforward. But then, you know, once we start getting into it, and the, they'll still be lawyers who will consult with their schools, right? And a school will throw, gosh, darn it. All right. You guys stay with this. I, I'm going to, um, I'm going to check my, my Wi-Fi here, so hang on. Um, all right, hang on. I will. I will be right back here. What in the? What in the world? Um, so. Thank you uh, for letting me know that connections come back. And I, it, I can see it like all, all back up in the, the left-hand corner. I don't know what's going on. I, I did have a little communication here with the other people in the house and said, <laughs> if you're deciding to download, um, you know, every, uh, every audio book that's ever been made and, and every encyclopedia and whatever, uh, don't do it now. Um, so I don't know. But um, so, yeah, one pop, I could go for popcorn, too. I've been eating bananas lately. Like, I, I bike, you know, I biked 81 miles on uh, Tuesday. It was great. It was a great. I had coffee, got up early, uh, black coffee, and ate bananas. And, man, like, I was just, like, juiced for the whole ride. Caffeine will, I mean, I don't do a lot of caffeine. So when I do coffee, it, it does have that jolt. And, um, and you know, bananas really keep the electrolytes going. So, and I had a, I had a banana on the, in the, on the top of my bag in the back, uh, 
for biking. But uh, yeah, I could have gone further. Like I, I only really planned out 80, about that 80, 81 mile trek. But um, it was it was great. Got home, put everything away. And then afterwards, you have to charge everything, every, you know, all the lights and all of that stuff. And I, I have um, a JBL speaker and an old Samsung M3 MP3 player. And I, I put uh, podcasts and audiobooks on the MP3 player. And then um, the JBL speaker, you know, obviously it, I used to, to listen. But that's great because that thing will, will play the entire time I'm out there. Um, so, yeah, it's cool. Um, anyway, that was awesome. That was and I don't know if, if you guys have, let me just get it over on this other side here. Let me show you a uh, picture here of the, uh, let's do this. So, all right, so that is my, that's my bike. And so, um, Got that in 2013 new. Now, like most of this bike has been replaced because I did have an accident with it. So, uh, you know, like the wheels are new. They're, they were custom pulled wheels a couple of years ago. Um, so like it took the guy a day to make the two of them. And, and then, um, yeah, all the gearing and everything is kind of different from what the original bike was like. But uh, so this is a huge bag, this Topeak bag, and you can tell I've got the banana on the top of it. Right here is the MP3 player, and over here is the JBL speaker. Um, and so I've got a gallon of water in here. I've got water here, here, and then here. And then um, my medical stuff is on this side, and then on the other side is like my bike tools and stuff like that, and some food. So um, that, uh, and I worked, I, I, tune this up a few day, days before the ride. I still have like, you know, the, the friction brakes here instead of disc, but I, I kind of prefer that actually. Um, so everything works good, but 81 miles, um, really good ride on Tuesday. I felt great. I absolutely felt phenomenal. It was like 83 degrees out and just a light breeze. And, um, but yeah, this, uh, it, it, when I load this thing up, right, a gallon of water is eight pounds. So then like everything else on here, um, I add a lot of weight to this bike when I take it out and I, I made pretty good time. Like I was, I was clipping, you know? Um, so yeah, anyway, love biking. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, do you pee on the side of the road? Andrew, I can't respond to that because, you know, I could get in trouble, I guess. But, uh, um, I do, I do have a couple places I can stop if I need water. So one is a bar that's out in the sticks that I go by. And, uh, but, uh, I'm usually pretty good and rear hub motor three. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, I, I could, I could do that. I mean, for me, it's, it's, I, it's, it's a fitness thing, right? I'm, uh, I am doing that to build up strength. Um, and I've, I don't know, I've thought about an e-bike to kind of change things up, but I still would want my, my, the beast, I would say. So, um, reject the training is, is Bolo. So, you know, going, going back on that, um, the law student, right? The law, and usually someone will say like that happened in a district I was at, like a student, a student wandered away and, uh, or they know somewhere where it's happened. And then I, I link out, I have three cases in Wisconsin where it happened within the last couple of years. So all of those, a student was found, but it was like wandering away from, from the school. Um, and you know, it is, it is instilling in people. And that's usually, that's what I'm all about, right? With safety is you make the best decision you use your professional discretion, believe that with your license, with the position you've been appointed to, they, the board of education, the community, whatever, expects you to make in the moment decisions, professionally use your, your discretion, weigh whatever information you have. As you'll become more informed. Maybe it wasn't the right call. Maybe there's other variables, but make the decision. Um, and then, you know, the, the, um, obvious, you know, the other part of this is, 
are people going to make the decision, yes or no, and then are they going to be backed? So if you're an administrator too, like it goes a long way to tell people um, as a principal, right? Hey, like if staff member, if you pull the fire alarm because you think there's smoke and actually there's just like dry ice coming out or someone is grinding something and, you know, some dust is coming out, you pull a fire alarm because you thought it was a fire. I'm not going to yell at you for that, right? Um, I, you aren't going to to be in trouble. If I've got your back on that. Um, or like, you know, that's that school board where the kid, the school's using the EpiPen the third time on the student and the parent comes in and says, that's it. I'm not going to keep paying for these medical bills. Um, there, the board of education didn't have the superintendents back. The board was kind of wavering on that. And it took the attorney for the school district to come in and, and really put the foot down on that. But that superintendent left. Um, that superintendent is like, I'm not... You know, I'm not going to be in a situation where, and then, you know, the board starts to question the superintendent and the soup's like, you know, because, you know, partly it seems reasonable to the board of education. This parent is saying, listen, call me. I live close by. I can be there. And then, you know, I can take the kid in and, and, but, um, but yeah, so it's these discretion calls. So that's something in school of errors. I mean, school of errors is, is really strong on that. It's saying, you know, Admiral Loy on September 11th, 2001. Think about that. The Harbor rescue 500,000 people from lower Manhattan in nine hours on September 11th, 2001. Admiral Loy of the Coast Guard said, goes on, goes on Marine radio. He says, Hey, if you've got a boat and you can come down here and help in the rescue, do it. That's it. And people showed up right with their private, you know, boats and with, with, uh, you know, the, the, the ferry boats, uh, tugboats, and, you know, there were some municipal boats in there too. But um, a lot of this was this organic, never worked together ragtag crew of boats and captains. And uh, and it worked. They they figured out what to do. You know, they're taking doors and they're using them as gangplanks and they're taking sheets and writing Hoboken and, you know, they get out here to get over to Hoboken. And um, no lawsuits out of that. Nobody died, right? And... How does that work? It just, a system develops in nine hours and then it's gone, right? It's this amazing thing. Well, I mean, I wrote about it extensively in School of Errors, not just the mechanics of that, but the psychology of it, which I think is fascinating. But because Admiral Lloyd didn't hesitate, he didn't he didn't say, this could be the end of my career. I could be sued for this, you know, and, and you know, just imagine a boat sinks that has, you know, 50 people on it because I said, you know, come and come and do this. So someone comes in and overloads their boat, right? So like, didn't go through that whole checklist, didn't go through the heuristics of, of all of these things, just said, listen, like we've got, you know, the information he had were thousands of people were on lower Manhattan, the roads were shut down in the bridges, um, that it was still active, right? All of the towers had not yet been felled. Um, and these people are coming down and, and they want to get off the island and he's like, let's do it like figure it out, get people down there. And, and people do this, right? We, we, the systems develop, we work things out. Um, and, and that's the part where, um, the lawyer was really the one that had everybody's back. And that's the thing when you are in these positions as a, as the person in charge, right? Maybe if, even if the principal's not there, sometimes these, these rural schools, like in my state, we have 421 school districts and some of them are very rural in northern part of the state meaning like th there there might just be a few homes around country homes and that's it and you have to drive like from there you know 15 minutes to get to the in town school right you know so that is not uncommon and you know sometimes a principal is shared between two schools so maybe the principal is at the school in the morning but not in the afternoon so like uh, there's a lead teacher then who's put in charge but wh whoever's in charge right has to be willing to make a decision and i believe that the right decision absolutely i believe that the right decision in this is to use the drone um and i'm not i i'm you know david brought up a great point right there you you can have these these this can fall apart on you like right there could be negatives from this this person could end up with a video or the you know if the child is going toward the water and they're, they believe the drone is i mean there there are things but there's also right you, somebody's there you're able to say hey like you know he has on is on a orange brown uh, i think a denver broncos jacket and uh um so 
someone is watching the screen as this guy's like flying the drone. Like, I think it was kind of, he's over kind of over there. Some of the kids were saying, and, and, you know, if you're able to, to find Bruce, right. That's a huge, uh, that's a huge success. And, you know, so this, it's a tough call, right? That's where everything forensically um, looks perfect to people. Like they can say, oh, this should have happened and this should have happened. And, or something gets found out later. Like, oh, you know, this person didn't go through your background check as a school or they were a, a sexual offender, right? They shouldn't, they shouldn't have even been on school property. And, and you, you might have to deal with the media just beating you up or people like going with your board or your superintendent on some of these things. Um, you know, or even coming back and saying, how oh, could you be so unprepared that you didn't have a, a high dev drone and someone, you know, who could um, operate it knowing that you're a rural school, you know, a quarter mile away from a river, which, you know, <laughs> how many thousands of schools like that are there in America? And, or what if you're in a city, right? And there's busy roads. I mean, this is schools. I, I remember an elementary school where I was an administrator, not at that elementary school, but in that district. And uh, there was a student who would frequently run from the school and and the school was probably a hundred feet away from a very busy road. So you couldn't, I mean, we ended up putting a fence up to um, try to, to mitigate if he or another student would, would do that, but still, right. You, what do you do? And one of the questions we had, I brought in the lawyer to answer some questions with school staff because they're like, well, what do we, what do we do? Um, and, and one question was, what if the student just takes off running, right? Like the parent drops the student off for school. And the moment the student steps out of the car, the student runs toward the road, right? So it's, and could I, as a school staff member, you know, if I'm running after a student, what if I have to reach out and basically tackle them so they don't go on the road? Am I protected by that? So, I mean, these questions were coming out to the school lawyer, but, uh, but yeah, this is this is a, a fascinating um, a case study because the more people think about it, and the more they return to it, right? They they kind of think of their own. Oh, do I have? Do am I a person who would assert my discretion? Right? Would I take an alpha position on uh, on this? Um, and you know, because there, if you took if you took the scenario across districts, there there would be some situations where people would lose their job over this by having flat out because of the way that the district operates. And so you have to measure that. You have to gauge that. Um, I would say in most of the situations, a person would be backed and validated. And then you know so there would some some situations where boards would and administration above would get kind of um, wishy washy on this. But uh, I don't know. Be a strong person. Be decisive. You've been put in that position, and this is where I think if I was was the administrator and had to make that call, I would say, "Listen, I was uh, you hired me into this leadership role. Um, I need to make um, fast decisions in you know matters that could poten potentially be um, life threatening, and you know this is something we don't have a policy, we don't have a protocol on, and whatever. So this is the de decision I made, and I would do it again." Um, so, but that's, I also tell my administrators, have your own insurance policy, right? Your, your own errors and emissions policy, because, you know, you never know. Well, I, I shouldn't say you never know. You never know exact, exactly how people will support you or not support your organizations until you go through a case study like this. They can kind of tilt, tilt their hand, right? If you do this as a case study, they'll kind of show you. So if you run this just as a case study in your district, right away and your superintendent is saying, oh, I don't know, you know, maybe don't do anything. The person can be there, but don't do anything until police arrive, right? Let the police decide if the person should use the drone or not. Um, you know, so you're going to get a feel for if what, to what level you're going to be backed or not back, backed. I mean, I worked for a, a number of um, school leaders who would be like, go in and do it. Like, Absolutely. And I've got, I've got your back. And actually I, I, I worked with another one who I'm quite sure would be apprehensive on this and would say something like, okay, that person's there, but yeah, let the police or fire or whoever comes in, let them know that they have this asset that they can maybe contribute. Um, so again, um, but what if, it, what if it is, you know, five, 
seven minutes before anybody else is out there. And then also, you know, it's not like you're going to have a ton of responders initially out there and, and they're going to have to devote to assessing all of the resources, not just this drone guy. But there, there was, there was a friend of mine, an administrator who used the term, we, you know, there's a things you, you have to cowboy as an administrator or just like a leader. Right. And, uh, you just have to get on and you've got to ride and, and you're riding and hopefully people are riding in the same direction, but you're riding, you know, like you, that's, it's your thing. And um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in that belief, right? You have, if you're in the position, you should be able to act with professional discretion in that position. Um, so this, again, you know, like this could go, could go sideways. You know, you, you could have a district suit. You could have a person personally suit of saying, yeah, you use someone who wasn't part of the plan, you know, that this was, was reckless and all that stuff. But, um, I would, I would argue strongly to use the, use the drone. So anyone else want to chime in on that? So fire alarm becomes a fire drill. You know, Heath, that's a good point earlier. Like if someone, if there's some dust in a hallway or, you know, something like that, that, that looks like it's, um, possible smoke and someone does a, does a fire alarm, um, it does turn into, to a drill. And I, that's a really good point. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, some people just, they, they, they really get critical and kind of in the, in the self-reflective or, um, on these things and, and I'm with you, right? Then, Hey, well, then how did we do like the people get out? I mean, ask the right question. The right question isn't how did we, um, misinterpret this to be a fire when it wasn't, I mean, you know, it just, the, the right question is, well, how, how the, how the drill go? Did people get out of the building? Did they use their two way radios? And, you know, was there any, anything that we, you know, learn from that or, or, you know, whatever it is, you know, one of the things that's really, really uh, out there too. And right here is a uh, aggressor, be aggressive, be, be aggressive, be aggressive, be, be aggressive. So it's your chant. It's the uh, cheerleading thing. So um, when they micro trip all the kids, we won't need to have this uh, drone debate. So um, would you need the drone though to find, to ping for the microchip? So Andrew, there's there's actually um, a district in California. It might have been a school. I think it was a school in California. And I, I can't, I don't know offhand, but this was maybe 10 years ago or maybe 15 years ago. It wasn't recent. And an elementary school, um, and it might have been something like a K2 or whatever, but the the district that school offered to have every student um, implant it with a microchip. And the reason they did it is to for they said school safety. So we would know if the student was on. I think it was more like an RFID thing at that point. Basically, they would know if that student was on their property or not. And most parents agreed to it. With it wasn't anything that was mandated. It was made an offer. Like how do you, it's not easy to find this this article or this study. I've got it somewhere in one of my files, and I kind of bring that back because I I said. I don't know if I said on PBS or when I presented, I said, you know, if this was out there, right, if if schools went to parents and said, we can, you know, microchip your kid and then we'll, you'll, we'll always know where your, your kid is in the building and all of that. Um, or like, hey, we'll microchip your kid and then they don't have to have any money with them and they go through the lunch line, it automatically does this. Or if there's a medical event, anything happens, a bus crashes, anything like, or there's an intruder, we'll, we'll know. Like um, there are, I would say more than half would agree to that. And it's crazy to think that, but people go down that road. They're like, sure, I believe, because you're telling them this will make them safer. It'll make their kids safer. And, and they're like, well, it's it's really what a drone, it's a chip under the skin. And, and yeah, so um, we'll do it. And that was really a bizarre kind of one-off, not, I don't know if it was a case study in California. Again, it's like 15 years ago. But I think, I think when they did it, the, they believe no one would really take them up on it. Right. Like it was just, and suddenly like everybody, not everybody, but like a majority of people did take them up on it. So it's really crazy. Um, so, yeah. So the one thing with Bruce too is, and it's in lost person behavior in the book. 
students or people who, who wander, or it could be a person with um, uh, dementia. I worked at a, a dementia facility and they had, you know, delayed, you'd push the door and the alarm would sound and it would be 15 seconds later. Um, but the, it's not uncommon for a person with dementia to wander, especially Alzheimer's more advancing, but you still have your physical faculties. And they tend to wander, um, their pattern is very linear. So like if they'll walk in one direction, if there's a fence, they'll climb over the fence or they'll keep going. Like the, uh, someone with autism will tend per the research of lost person behavior, especially younger, uh, will tend to go toward bodies of water or pieces of machinery. So like if it's a farm field, it'll be by the, tr the tractor. Like these would be places statistically you would most likely find. Um, first, so they would go towards something versus like a straight line, which would be a person with dementia or Alzheimer's, but um, some schools um, and some parents have their child wear a, a GPS tag, right? So they can be found, you know, almost like an Apple Air, right? Um, so as a school, do you offer that? Now, again, this case, people say like, well, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, maybe that could have happened. Okay, but and Bruce doesn't, again, doesn't have a history of doing this. I mean, there's, you know, there could be some question of maybe this could happen with Bruce, but it's something where it's not like your eighth time like this has happened. So like this is, do you use a technology? What does it mean if you're, is this profiling then to, to, you know, have some students with autism or cognitive intellectual disabilities wear these um, tr basically tr tracking devices? Um, You'd have to have a history, right, of of wandering, uh, but so these questions come in, right? They they get like it's really deep. Um, so, Agorizer is saying, I was just thinking that in my my head. So this microchip, yeah, I I have a feeling the microchip stuff is going to heat up again. Um, it just in general, like I I I just think we're going to see that discussion, hear that discussion more in society, right? Like all this cashless society type stuff and identifying your vaccination status. And I mean, all of these things, right? I mean, you could make a pretty compelling logical argument if you, I, when I was, when I was a kid, like I was, um, I, well, let me see. I think when I was, I got my driver's license. Yeah, I think that was it. When I got my driver's license, it was a long time ago, right? I'm not a young guy. Um, you could also have your, they, it was recommended you go to your medical provider and they could put your entire file on a micro fiche thing. And they gave you then a, um, like a credit card and it had this little micro fiche thing laminated within it. So if you had like a microscope or whatever, right, you could go in and read this file. And I had that because the thought is that you get a car accident, right? They would know your blood type. They'd know your, you know, any special medical stuff. But it was it was not a computer chip. It was microfiche on this thing. Um, but I think if someone came out, it, it, you know, and started to make these compelling arguments of saying, you know, anything happens, right? Like if you were in an accident, your medical information could immediately be, you know, available and your other people to contact or if you got lost. And a number of people are going to go for that, right? Or they'll go for what they think is convenience of saying, you'll never have to buy, you know, a, a, a ticket, you know, carry a ticket again or anything like that or cash. Like it'll just go through this system. But um, agorizer, or Keith is saying tranquilizer gun for the runners. Um, if they steal something, they'll bill you. Um, could happen. Heath, the White House. Oh, I guess got a good, good sense of humor. Um, so do you have anything you would suggest to me so to, to change this um, case study? And like, so I only use the four slides to kind of just give a context because I, I first did this without the slides and some people really couldn't wrap their mind around. That's why I'd have the first slider, you could kind of see the woods and, and then like the person's, the, the drone, like what they were. And, and then it gave enough context like the four. Um, but what what do you think would help, um, you know, either like the actual presentation of this or the questions to ask afterwards? 
or like how do you how do you think this is like one of my main um main, main activities to to really shake people kind of you know to, you, you got the balls and uh you're shaking the board until they all get in their spot i mean this is simulated annealing right this is kind of getting people to shake down to like do i believe i have discretion and then also like would i actually probably do this like would i make this call and do I think people at my back are like, would I have their back? Like as a superintendent, that per- the principal's out there and they make this call and would I stand up and back them a hundred percent? And no, and again, nobody's perfect in real time. That's, that is, uh, and as an expert witness, um, you know, that's not this would be a court thing or anything, but that's something that uh, needs to be brought back out because like, you know, once you present things to, to a jury or to a judge or something like that in and forensically it seems very clear right but again if you go back to in the moment like nothing is perfect in real time again this is an afternoon recess here if it's wisconsin it's afternoon in december 4 30 it's dark and then what do you do um you know if there's not snow and it's uh, suddenly you've lost daylight to try to do this so i mean what do you do um something something liberty something something security something something neither yeah um, it's, it's, uh, so where I, where I go at this and, and please, I mean, type it and, and I'll put it up and I, I go for prof- prof- professional discretion. Um, what do you, what do you deem that you have professional discretion, which you do if that's the role that you have, right? If, if you're the person in charge and, um, or like, you know, no one talks about this in schools, but people walk by fire extinguishers in the hallway every day in a school, and no one knows if they have the professional discretion to use it. Like, no one ever knows that. They, they typically don't practice with it. They don't, you know, if there's a fire in a wastebasket, would they go to the hallway, grab the fire extinguisher, and aim at the base of the fire and, you know, to put it out? And, of course, you know, um, would they do that? So um, this is... Heap this is saying put an emphasis on uh, common sense, critical thinking. Yeah, absolutely. And this is where schools can um, codify this in Board of Education policy. So there's a little sidebar on this. So I work with the school leaders to actually craft sample policy and to have their Board of Education um, uh, consider and hopefully pass and enact the the policy of saying administrators, um, you know, have the, uh, uh, we expect our administrators to use their professional discretion um, during, you know, situations that they deem, you know, could bring harm to, you know, people or, and, um, you know, that the board, you know, you'd have to have some statement in there, you know, based upon the, you know, we understand what trainings and everything that, there will always be contingency situations that nobody has anticipated or trained for. And this is not just in schools, this is in life, but we want our administrators to be swift and decisive. And we believe, you know, that we've hired people uh, with those skill sets or we continue to instill in them that philosophy as a district. You put that out, boom, that's in board policy. And it, it, it could be board policy. There's board policies out there saying like, st- staff will give students three praise comments per every one negative comment. That's a board policy. I don't know if you really need to make that board policy, but that's a board policy. But you put this in board policy of, of professional discretion or like to say our staff, we believe, and then maybe an example like professional, you know, I tell people to get really overt in this. If your board's willing to go there, put in professional discretion of saying, you know, we, uh, example, you know, um, a staff member being able to activate one of our safety systems, such as intruder or fire alarm or whatever, if, if they deem that there is, you know, if they professionally deem that there are reasons to do that. Um, so I think you could, and, and we usually come up with, with some stuff that, that is really powerful. Um, but there the board is, is committing to it. And also, I think for every administrator, every teacher you bring into that system for induct, induct, induction, you're, you, you're pointing to that policy and saying, you know, we've got your back to make the right decision. And then also, if something 
turns out murky or mucky or whatever falls apart. Um, the they come back to that policy and say, I was acting, you know, within policy to use my professional discretion. And you think you don't have to be overt in telling people that they have the right to pull a fire alarm or, or you know, the, the right to um, have somebody use a drone or something. But you need to do that because people just they're not sure if, if they have a tool. And you also have to realize they've come from other systems where other schools or other jobs or other experiences in life were that maybe hasn't been the case for them. Maybe they've been in a very hierarchical structure where they could not make those decisions or they, were, they would be fired if they made those, you know, or, um, but I, but so we, we twist this to around the corner, you know, we, we, we kind of unstick this and, and, and come up and say, what would a board of education policy say for professional discretion? Um, actually, let me underline that over here. Um, just as, I have a note, professional discretion policy. I have a, a um, my notes for the upcoming class, things I have to add in yet. So um, the dishonesty offends me. Okay, dishonesty of what below, what exactly are you? Um, most important, always keep it simple. Yeah, Heath. So there will be just like Admiral Loy on 9-11. And that's an example I would use if I was um, teaching, or not, I guess if I had my board of education every year, I, I would show the video Boat Lift, which is 11 minutes long, narrated by Tom Hanks. It's, um, and it's it's about Admiral Loy making this decision, right? And, and, and I would show that video to my school board every year. And then I would would follow it up with this policy of saying we want our you know our school leaders or people in charge to have this Admiral Loy mentality. We will back them. Um, so yeah, it's uh, and and to, and to keep it simple, right? So what what happens in situations like Uvalde is one example of where you start to bounce around who do you think has authority to make the decision the um the our lady of angels school fire in 1958 was another one in schools um who has the authority to pull the fire alarm right and you could just keep going down the line in a number of things you know it doesn't have to be school stuff but i i, I like apollo 13 right you go work the problem you know like gene Kranz was saying we got to figure this out. Like, so um, we are going to work the problem. And that's the thing. Like, we need to work the problem mentality. And those are the people I want to hire. And those are the people I want to work with. Um, again, I've had most of my experiences have been with that. But actually, I've worked with um, administrators that haven't been that way. And they have strengths in other areas. But administrators would say, oh, like, you know, let's throw the brakes on, you know, have the drone you know, I believe they would respond of saying, have the drone person wait until um, fire or EMS, you know, fire or um, police arrive and then let them decide how they want to incorporate this person. So, but what if that again, six, seven miles, you know that you're near a river. Um, so, oh my goodness, it's Mal at CNC Works. So you're like, hey, hi, buddy. So, I've been seeing the amazing uh, creations you've been putting out there. So awesome. And I will be driving through your neighborhood on my trucks this fall to the university along the Wisconsin or the Mississippi River. So, um, yeah, I'll yell out the window and say, CNC works as loud as I can. Um, so this is, this is, where I think in school safety, we really have a crisis of professional discretion. Um, that is, that's where it's at. It's, it's not about resources necessary. I mean, these are all issues, right? But it's professional discretion. Who, who's going to act? Who's going to stand? I had, I had someone from a school district, um, or that had listened to my, you know, read school of errors and, and knew me and the PBS presentations. And they emailed me, uh, earlier in the week and they said, we just got through the most insane safety drill like that we we've ever gone through, you know, like um, it was way, way out 
in left field of uh, you know people running up and down hallways and banging on doors and and stuff like. And this was just staff, right? So, well, this was a staff training, um, and this this teacher came forward and he said with some other teachers. So he sent me an email. He said, you know, I've read School of Airs. I've seen your work. Like I know you. And like this, and they wanted to do it with students. Like students were going to be coming in and they wanted to, to replicate this with students. And he said, I told them, you know, this isn't the way to, to do this. And, and here's why and whatever. And, um, and he got a hold of me a day later and said, administration changed their position because I said, here's, here's the IRB article, right? It would do no harm. And like, what are you really trying to learn if you're doing this type of stuff? And then they also had something where they would say, there is a shooter in the hallway outside the band room. It's like what they would announce. Well, that like that's going to that's going to freak everybody out and cause cause to be crazy. But what if there's what if there were two shooters, right? Or what if by the time you said that, thirty seconds later, that person has gone from the band room um, fifty you know fifty feet away and now on another. So that type of stuff is just just not complete thinking. But I was glad. I mean, this was a person again who stood up and and uh, professional discretion. And, and it was really like using my book to, you know, just come in and hammer this in the PBS presentation. So I'm like, good for you. So, um, so yeah, uh, Mallet is saying he's going to be in lacrosse on Saturday. So I'll tell you, I won't be there this Saturday, but it won't be, it won't be too far down the road. And, uh, and yeah, I will, I will be over there. So actually the, thanks. Um, I need to, I just, I, I need to check that my, <laughs> my, my university uh, badge still gets me into the buildings. So, um, but yeah, that is, that is some good stuff. Um, so yeah, so, so discretion is a big part of, of school safety. No one talks about it. Nobody has, has this in policy unless you've taken a class from me. Um, and, and now we have a billion dollars coming out toward mental health services in schools. I'm not anti-mental health. I'm saying there isn't a framework for that. And by the way, like, what are we doing to improve um, or to gauge and to measure discretion? Like who can activate these drills in, in high stakes decision making, which I did my dissertation on at the university level, military, healthcare, and schools. Um, and so it's like, it's really discretion, right? Um, and I think it should even be um, codified in either state law or federal law to some extent. Now, we don't want to create this crazy immunity thing where people can, people's decisions can can never, uh, you know, put the shield around them where they can never be challenged and never questioned. I mean, there has to be what the legal standard usually is. What would a reasonable person do? Um, now, a reasonable person would be like, what would a school administrator do or what would a teacher do it's like in that role right what would what would we assume a reasonable person would do and does this seem reasonable so it's just it's a legal term it comes from you know the expert witness area and stuff like that does this seem reasonable for you know a person to respond this way that would have this training and have experience in a school um and not again that is perfect or not perfect it's just like would this seem reasonable um so these are the questions that aren't happening. Schools are moving toward fortification. These mental health providers are, are, are you know, this money's flooding in. One is I don't think there'll be enough mental health providers for the money, even though it's kind of crazy. Like you think money will buy buy you anything. But right now, Des Moines School District is doing $50,000 bonuses for teachers and they're not able to recruit. Um, you could look that, look that up, right? Des Moines School District, Iowa. But uh you know, I, I talked about this on John Crump tonight with John and, and Rich, and Rich brought it up, and he said, you know, it's like your schools aren't taking care of their core business, and he, I've never heard anybody say that to me before, and but he's right on, because the core business is having your all, getting your all of your teachers right that you're fully staffed, that people are fully trained, and then like these other things come in, but you have this massive entropy of your core system, so you know if we if in my house I have four smoke detectors now, what if I only had batteries in three of those? One of them might have a battery. So think of that kind of like analogy with a teacher, like I'm down one battery. But what the city has said is we're not going, you know, or the, you know, the people out there, they're not going to help me get another battery or like, a, you know, school's teacher. They're not going to help that. What they will do is they'll, they'll rent a $500,000 fire truck for, you know, five years. 
and and they'll keep it in the neighborhood. So if there is a fire, like the fire truck will be able to get over here. And but then after five years, it's gone. Kind of a grant thing. It's it's missing. But I'm like, well, you know, maybe that's good, right? But also like if I could have that smoke alarm battery and there was smoke, it would detect it. Maybe I could get a fire extinguisher and get things out earlier. I could get myself and family out of the house earlier. Really like the battery, that threat detection system that needs to be there. Like that's part of our safety system. So, and we know that when students have more time with, uh, with a teacher, right. When there's uh, more smaller class sizes, students report, that they feel more engaged, school connectedness, CDC studies. Those are all very strongly correlated. Uh, I talked about this on John Crump, Crump Live too. Um, if you have, you know, people who are um, depression, uh, even uh, people who are who are suicidal, um, th- if you have somebody who is is with them, right? It doesn't have to be a therapist necessarily or a psychiatrist. I'm not saying it's a, it's a replacement for that person, but just a study of saying studies have said, you know, if someone shows an interest, that's why these youth mentoring programs are out there. Someone shows an interest in someone of what they're doing, spends time with them. That person's likely to have a better, you know, say, say, I feel better, right. About myself. I I'm thinking they're using more future terms of I'm thinking down the road of things. Um, they, their attendance increases their, you know, so these things happen just by having people there. And right now in the schools, we don't have the people there and we don't have the people to man the threat assessments and all that stuff. So Andrew's saying forest smoke detectors are overkill. Well, I have one in the garage. I have one to my left down here. That used to be a bedroom. Now we use it as a craft, but that one is still over there. And then I have one in our hallway upstairs and I don't know where the other, the other one is. There, no, I got one right here at the base of the steps. Um, so I got, uh, I've, I've got uh, four. So, and, and I have two fire extinguishers, one right around the corner from where I'm at, and then one in my, one in my garage. Um, so yeah, these, these are, you know, so that's where I, I think people get things really wrong with school safety and just like kind of safety and decision-making in general. Um, is they don't look at the discretion part. They they don't look at that. And one of the things I've said to, to you know people who've asked me, you know, what are what are your thoughts on Uvalde? I mean, from the information that I have, right, that is just what is public information. But um, it that was an issue of discretion, right? Somebody had an opportunity um, early on to um, sh- shoot the the shooter, right? before the shooter entered the school. Like somebody said they had the, um, one of law enforcement said they they had that. They had a line, line of sight, they could take the shot. And either, either, I don't know, they didn't, they decided themselves, they needed discretion to be authorized to, to do that, even though this person, right, is um, how that system worked. But that was an issue of discretion, right? That person has this, this opportunity to do this, knowing what had unfolded, right? This person has crashed his vehicle. They've made this, they, they, they had, at that time, I think they knew through 911 that the grandmother had been shot. I mean, there was enough information in this, these posts of this, this um, person was likely trying to bring uh, uh, death into this, this setting, right? You got to make the call and the call has to be, you have to, you have to do what you can to neutralize the threat. And not to, to run things up and down a, a, a chain of, of decision-making or indecision-making, right? Um, and, I mean, you can see this on 9-11, too, like outside of Admiral Loy. If once you get into the the government, the you know, the the how the actions by, by government were very disjointed of who thought they had authority or who, you know, was jumping up to take authority and kind of leapfrogging over other people who might be like really ahead of them to make decisions. And, um, but you can work a lot of these things out when you do these, these kind of case studies. So this is a case study. And then I actually do tabletop activities where, um, in a, you know, a tabletop could be, um, anything from, you know, there's, there's a bus accident to a power out. Like I'd like to do things that aren't as graphic, right? Um, yeah, your school or there's, yeah, um, there's a rapid onset flood 
right? Uh, and it's not going to be safe to run the the bus routes. So, you know, what do, what do you do? Um, you're going to have to keep students in the school. Communications are failing kind of throughout the, the area. Um, you might actually become like a site for people who their homes are flooding. How do you do that while you still have kids in the building? Or how do you bring people into the building? And how are you allocating your food resources? Um, I mean, all of these, all of these things, like how do you inventory your assets? How are you assigning other people to be in charge? And again, this is where people think that's um, all these contingencies, right? The answer is we just got to come up with a bigger playbook. We have to, that, you know, we know which to flip to flip chart page. I did this, Andrew, you're going to love this. I did this. Um, oh God. I don't know, 15 years ago, maybe. And we are, uh, we were making, I shouldn't say we, because I really wasn't on board with this, but the district was making new flip charts to put by the door. This was at least 15 years ago. Um, so, you know, the flip chart thing of, oh, if there's a bomb threat, like here's what you do. And if there's a tornado and intruder, I mean, those type of things. So, so they have this by, by they print these up by the door. I took one of them and I, and I added another tab underneath and the tab was um, like flying saucer attack or something like that, UFO attack. And I, I might still have one. I might still have it. I think I, I, I took it then after. Anyway, it was, I put it up in, it wasn't a classroom, but it was an area where the, these things were hanging. I replaced the one that was in there. So all of those were there. Plus there was a extra tab. And then I had made an actual directions. And one was I had a, an image of a UFO and it said underneath, and this was like from the movie, like uh, July, the what um, Independence Day. I'm like, you know, if, if uh, unidentified alien craft is hovering over the school or school property or a bus or bus, you know, stop, um, don't throw things at it. If there's people around who are, you know, trying to fire weapons at it, tell them not to, you don't want to provoke this. Um, and, you know, all of these things, uh, you know, I basically took this statement from Independence Day that was playing on the news <laughs> and I just kind of put it in here and I had this graphic. And um, we had fire drills, we had tornado drills, we had things where people are supposed to grab their flip charts and or people like the conference room have it, grab a flip chart. And guess what? Nobody ever knew that that tab was there because no one ever uses these things. Like it just didn't make sense sense to have people try to go through all of these steps of something linear that's not going to be will be a non-linear event to have linear steps that's where I, school of errors gets into that but um but yeah and then I, I i brought it out i think at an administrative meeting and i'm like hey the flip chart like let's look at this and, and i just turned to that back one where it had the ufo above like a bunch of people and, and then it started to dawn on people and I'm like, yeah, it's been there for like two months or three months and we've run whatever drills. Um, but there, there was a school I was working with and one of their, it wasn't here in my, I don't know if that makes a difference, but one of their things was in, in their contingency binder, plane falls from sky. This was after nine 11. So, and, it, and I assume they were, that was the language I used in case there was a plane attack, but yeah, but they it said you know if a plane falls from the sky i guess a plane could fall from the sky anywhere like and land but they had this thing of like here's what to do and i'm like well <laughs> i mean is there some and i i asked i said why is this here and they never they didn't really know but i'm like are you close to an area like an airport i mean is, is there is there a reason to first of all i don't think like this would happen with prevalence where it wouldn't need to make it into a flip chart but i mean is there some reason this happened? Like the, the, this is here. Did this happen previously in the school or a nearby school? And um, and no one really knew. And I said, take it out. Like this is it, crazy. Like how are you going to know if a plane crashes into a, a school building or school property and what you would do? Like at that at that site, you know, right? Like. Um, and, you know, so, I mean, it is that it just didn't make, it didn't make sense. So, the, and it was a thick binder. I think it was like two binders actually that they had. And you pull it off, you can see like where the dust is, you know, because the binders have been in that long. 
Um, but that was, there's some people who try to do that, right? They just try to continue to see things out and you get to be a mile wide and inch deep and nobody cares. But, um, so Andrew's saying, when has a bomb gone off in school? Just call our bluff. There are some schools that have done that. And even in my area where they had multiple bomb threats called in like multiple days and they were canceling. And then, um, they didn't, um, eva- they didn't evacuate the schools or what they did was they would move the students instead of sending them home. They move them to like another school building. So anyway, the thought was the school, the students are probably calling this in people who are kids who are students. So like, we're going to make it as, as inconvenient for them as possible instead of getting a day off of school right you you're going to instead of going to the middle school you're going to have your school over at an elementary school for a day or but um but yeah i mean like major sporting events and you know stuff like that they don't evacuate eighty thousand people out of a stadium um they have uh you know, on site, you know, there's so many things with, with these big event security things that I can't go into. It's just a, a, amazing, but, um, but yeah, so it's, but I'm not saying whatever your protocol is bomb, bomb threats, um, uh, don't happen much, but, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, whatever your protocol, but this protocol, um, this one district had adopted a protocol where they would, um, move students out of the building and then from that building to another educational site. So, Andrew's saying, students calling bomb threats to my high school in the 90s from payphones. School removed the payphones when they figured it out, yeah. And I, I guess maybe, thankfully, we, we don't really hear about that very much today. And maybe it is because it would be um, hypothetically easier to trace that back to the originator. But the other thing is, like, you know, the kids really care on some of the stuff of what they're, what they're doing. I don't know. Um, so I also, I also wonder, you know, in the, when I like in the drone thing and stuff, um, I would love to do that and then like ask a community or like ask a school board. And so, so when I do this, I, if I don't ask people like, what would you do while everybody's in class? Because they're going to, whatever the first person says, that's what other people would say. That's what, that's how that would work out. So I give the case study, I go through it and then I, I give people a sheet of paper and I have, um, yes and no on it. And and I say, just circle one, right. (laughs) And, uh, and then I'm going to collect the paper and I'm just going to come up to the board and put a check mark under yes or no. So, you know, no one's going to know if you said no or yes, you can, you know, when we get into the discussion part of this, you can say, I, I said yes, or I said no, but um, because, and, and that's another thing. So let's say you're going to do this with your staff of saying, with your teaching staff, I'm a principal in my teaching staff, and I want to know if they feel they have the professional discretion to activate the intruder alarm on their own, like to, to do that. This is the same thing I'd want to do. I'd want to present a scenario, and I'd want each of them to answer without knowing how other people have answered and anonymously. So like, if you use your handwriting, you know, maybe the, oh, they can find out. No, like I will give you a piece of paper and, you know, um, go around, put them in a, in a bucket. I'll shake the bucket up and I'm just going to go in and do a check mark thing so we can get a feel for what our inter rate reliability is. And people that works really well. Um, where I see, um, people, make mistakes with these types of training is like, Hey, show of hands, like who would say yes. And people be like, I don't know. Let's see what everybody else is going to do. It's people always, the small group theory. Um, once a few people answer anything in a direction, you always have some people who set the tone. Like they're just going to, to go and overtly put their opinion out there and other people be maybe just more naturally thoughtful and things and not the first. So you really have to do things where, you're getting only that person's thought and you're saying, don't, you know, don't talk to your neighbors and friends and see what they're writing. And, and, um, and that works really well. So another, you know, another thing I do, which is brand, brand new, like in the last year, 
is I um, have my new school administrators. One of the things they need to do is to take post-it notes at a, a staff meeting, right? And tell, you know, hand people a post-it note, say take a post-it note as you're going, um, and say, when this meeting is done, I want you to put the post-it note on the AED, right? Which is closest to your built, to, closest to your room or the fire extinguisher, right? Either one of those two things. I want you to put the, the, the post-it note um, you're not telling them either one, but you're saying like AED and maybe a different one you're doing like a fire extinguisher. And the thing is you want people to know where their assets are, where their safety assets are. And I can tell you, and then the, the soup or the principal or whatever else, I take a picture of it, of this thing with all the post-it notes and post it in class. That's, you just, that's what you gotta do. And then come in and talk about it. Like what did people, and they will say, this person worked here 10 years and they're like, I didn't even know there was an AED in my hallway. Like I, I know there's one like when we go by the lunch area, but I didn't know there was one right when we turn down the hallway, right? Where the classroom is, you go and, and, and people are like, they don't know because they, and all of us kind of could forget that, right? With any maybe workplace, unless some of these things are, are pointed out to us. Um, but that's something where it's like inventory your ass. And then the other coupling to that is write about it. Do a statement, a monitoring report to your school board. Heath says, hey, thank you very much, Heath. Appreciate it. Thanks, buddy. Take care. Had some uh, great stuff here. So thanks for helping me think. Um, write about it in a school board monitoring report. So that becomes something where you say, um, I did this activity or this staff participated in this activity to help practice where identification of our assets of AEDs. Um, and this is the feedback we had from staff and you could even put the picture in the monitoring report and then it put it by the board that it becomes part of board minutes and it shows that you are doing professional development, making people aware of their assets. Um, fire departments, including in my town here, uh, they will occasionally, maybe every other year, every third year, there's turnover in the fire department, right? You get, get new people. They will, um, deliver pizzas. So if you order a pizza from Pizza Hut, um, you can have it come on a fire truck, but it has to be like a donation of $10 or $20 or whatever. But um, so fire truck will bring it up to your house. So on the surface, right, you'd be like, well, that's kind of crazy because, you know, fire truck is a half million dollars or, you know, to just have this thing driving around town, delivering pizzas and putting, putting wear and tear on it and burning up the gas. Well, the, the deal is, and the fire departments talk about this, but, um, hey, it's Robert Ribbit Harrison. So, evening, are you, are you, I think you're in a time zone ahead of me. So, take care, buddy. It's good to see you. Zero white oil, fire trucks. Um, so, the reason that the fire department does that is because they want the firefighters to know where the fire hydrants are and to know these different parts of town, right? Um, so, on their way from the, the, pizza place to whatever they're delivering, they have to identify, oh, here's a fire, here's a hydrant, here's, and the hydrants are different based, you know, this has a 500 gallon per minute hydrant, this is a two. And that is critical, right, to, to do that, to become familiar. And there's also some public relations thing with that of, of seeing, you know, the fire department out doing this, but the fire, the fire department, you know, needs to, to state, we are doing this to know where our, um, you know, where the, the hydrants are that we are, we're, we're doing this. Um, so those are the type of things where people, they lose track of what their assets are. And, you know, even let's say this drone thing, what if this is a high school, uh, uh, you know, and a student wanders with, with autism or middle school and the school itself has a drone in the shop class, right? That they, or they have a drone for, um, you know, um, some kind of uh, geocaching club or whatever like that. So let's just say the drone is there and there's a teacher who, you know, is, is able to use it, knows how to use it and stuff like that. Do you think to bring that person into the rescue, right? Do you, how do you inventory your assets, especially when time is collapsing on you? Physical time, like when I wrote in philosophy of information about 
the fire in Gatlinburg and the wires were burning. The cable network was out. It burned right through the ground and, you know, the, the cell towers and stuff like time had collapsed. Um, and, and, you know, telephone poles are falling across the road and can't get down, um, in the mountain there. But, um, you know, how do you, how do you inventory your assets? So right there, like, that's a, that's a great question to ask. It's a process to go through and to write about and share with your board, put in your minutes or put in your, your newsletter for your community, right? Like here's, we were doing whatever we're inventorying a, and, or, you know, we met with our fire department during fire prevention week and um, we, they, we worked on what would be the, where would they likely stage their equipment? Um, so, you know, we were, we were kind of familiar with that of, uh, where these, these trucks would be coming in. So if we're getting kids out of a building, like we would try to take them to an area where the, you know, cause the fire truck, the fire chief probably say, well, we're going to stage over here, right? Because we have hydrants and we, we would want access to, to the hydrants and pumping, but like the, the school might also say, oh, like that's exactly where we're going to have 200 students, like standing over there in this, this, you know, paved area. Um, so we can move them, right? Because you're going to be accessing this, this hydrant over here and, and all this stuff. But those are the discussions that like inventory your assets and how you're going to, how you're going to access them and use them. And, um, but that's really, I think those are the big parts of school safety. And I was, uh, I was disappointed, frustrated by the safer communities bill because I thought the school safety stuff in there was, um, not not contributing to school safety, I guess. I, you know, I, I think the mental health stuff that was in there, the billion dollars, needed to be coupled to, there was a 2015, the mental health in schools bill. It didn't pass. Um, and that had a good framework that should have been passed, that should have been brought back. And then, um, you know, these fortifications happening. And I just, uh, I, schools, the only school, that, um, the only state that requires school selector doors is Kentucky. They also fund a marshal to go through and do random audits on that. So I'm like, you know, some of these things I think that were maybe more obvious, at least to me, um, didn't make it into this bill uh, and the safer communities bill. I'm like, you know, kind of why not? And, you know, um, I, I really struggle with, uh, again, you know, this putting all of this money into to mental health while your core business or having your your teaching staff intact and fully staffed, right? Your threat assessment team and yeah, that should be that should be your priority, right? Like that should those are the people closest to the the students and, and, and thinking like if you have one teacher per 35 kids or one teacher per 17 or 18 kids, like you would be better to try to have more appropriate teaching ratios, making sure that you have positions staffed. And um, so, yeah, it's really, it's really a good point. Um, and I, I mean, I, I don't know with the cares dollars, like that was just crazy stuff when that, when that came out um, to on how that, that funding for, you know, to make schools safer, I guess. But um, so, so yeah, we, so when I do my classes, I usually, I, I start every class out with um, an article. Everybody submits an article online and um, we go through and, and say, like, so you submit an article on, you know, whatever. Um, student did a, or, or administration did a search of a student and now it was deemed like it was a, the student was held against their will. They couldn't leave the school so whatever. Uh, so, okay, let's talk about this. What is your board of education policy? We always go that was your people bring up your board of education policy. Have you had any training in this? And, and again, it's only an article, so you can't get like, but, but what, how might you handle this if it was in your district? So we try to get into that, try to drive people back to their policies. So you get familiar, like with what your district policies might say. And if they don't say anything, you don't have policies, how might you handle this? So we do that. Um, and do a lot of um, kind of, you know, specific law stuff in the mornings. And then in the afternoons, we do case studies. And I absolutely love the case studies. I'll, you know, break people into groups of maybe three. And, you know, it's because um, 
you know, it's, it, we spread out at different rooms at the university and, and, uh, and I give them, you know, so you are the, um, uh, the, uh, team, uh, the matriculators or you're the recess ramblers, right? So I give everybody kind of this, and then you have like a, this framework, how you have to analyze something, uh, case study. Like one is, you know, a student comes in with a comfort animal, right. And, and a note for it, like, um, there was a lot of the previous district, but your district doesn't have a comfort animal pal policy. They have an ADA service animal, but this is a service animal. Boom. What do you do? Right. Um, and have people go through these, these case studies and those bring people to life. Like, and I always have up on the board, um, professional discretion, best interest of the, the student or, um, others, and then induction. Those are always three things up on the board. And you, with everything you do in my classes, I mean, because these are advanced law classes, right? Everything you do in the class, everything has to answer those three questions, no matter what it is. Everything we do comes right back to that. Okay, discretion, got it. And then the bottom one, the third one always is induction, right? The, the next person there, or if you're not there, how does this get conveyed, right? Because we are, if you're in schools, like you're in a high turnover environment, or you might have, it's kind of like a money ball environment right now. And I was talking about that too. For the first year, I actually wrote about that with the soups. You know, um, your job is no longer to, you know, recruit and think that you're going to have a teaching staff that's mostly cohesive for 10 to 20 years. Like those people aren't going to stick with you for that long. They're going to be there two, three years and they're going to be moving on. Right. Um, so this, it's a, it's this real money ball approach. Like you've got to put your team together, your, your staff every year, and they might be significantly different. And you might have to have people do different roles, teach different ancillary things, maybe that they haven't taught before or different, whatever, but different buildings. Um, so how do you to have your induction process knowing that we are now in a money ball type environment? Like how, how can you make this the best it can be? It used to be that, um, you know, like someone would retire after 30 years teaching and then their kid was a brand new teacher. So they would come in and, and take over the reins, right? In the harbor rescue of 9-11 in the harbor, um, the tugboat captains had the their family crest on the boat. They had been tugboat people in the harbor for two, 300 years. Like that had just been so ingrained, so much institutional legacy knowledge. It's just fascinating. So now... You don't have that anymore. So how do you replace what's the, you can't replace it, but you have to adopt a different model. Again, it's, you have to adopt this money ball type model of we're going to put this together. And it also is that way with students. Students are, um, they're, they're changing schools more frequently, or they're going from a virtual environment to a school or they're doing a hybrid. So like even your student body is turning over much more than it was in the past where, you know, everybody would be in kindergarten together. And then by 12th grade, maybe 80% of those kids would still be together. And that's just not the case anymore. So um, those are the things. And then you write about it, you document it, you submit it to your board in what's called a monitoring report. A monitoring report is just a statement of what you're doing. And it has to say how you're linking it to policy. So again, if you're doing this drill of how your assets of staff are identifying where the AED is by putting a sticky note on it and stuff like that. Um, that is for school safety and you can link it back into your policy for school safety. And, and if you have policy for discretion and, and here's an activity that we did to measure and to improve this or whatever. Um, and I'll have to pull up some of the monitoring reports that I've written over the years. And then, um, you submit it and typically it's in a board packet. It's not really discussed at a board meeting, but the board should look at a board of education and then they, they vote to accept the, the packet. It's called consent agenda. And basically they're saying, okay, you did this and we want it in our record, right? That, that you did this because it's, it's, it has to do with policy. If you're just putting something out there for the board, you wouldn't do a monitoring report for something that didn't have, didn't relate to policy. Um, the board of education's job is to make sure that the policies are developed and put in place and followed through. So their employee really is like the superintendent and that person is in charge of making sure that the policies are carried out. So the board of education is all about policy. So 
that's where you'd want this monitoring report to say, here's some policy that you have board of education and here's how we have addressed this policy. Um, but people don't do that. Right. And I've also seen board, some do, but some don't. If again, if you work with me, you do it. Um, if board of education will take shortcuts or, or, or their, their meetings, right. They'll have an agenda, which will be really thin. And then their minutes, you can go onto any board of education, you know, site usually and pull up the minutes from a meeting and some minutes are robust. Like, you know, they're, uh, very detailed on what was discussed at the meeting. And that's the official record of the meeting, right? Is the minutes and others will just say, you know, um, discussed, you know, replacing high school track board took bid of whatever voted five to three. Yes. Um, and there might be other questions in there of like, okay, but there was more to that, right? Because some of it was like, there had to be disability or accessibility was, was a big part maybe that was being discussed in that. And it doesn't seem like you have any discussion here of, or, you know, why you went with whatever vendor over like um, the mask stuff in schools was a big part of this school, school boards would, the minutes would say the board voted seven to one or the, the board voted like six to one to um, a, a mandate mask or re require mass. I guess not would re require would be the word for students and staff, you know, um, until, you know, the, the, the next time the board has us on a, a agenda and what was missing from that. And I went through lawsuits and I went through this with my administrators, right? And I said, the, the thing is like parents would sue districts and the, the flaw on the district side. Well, I mean, this whole thing was weird, but the district needed to be able to, to show here's how we informed our decision, right? Or the board of education would say, you know, we got information from the CDC, national Institute of health. We talked to the local clinic of, you know, so, and then that would, that would be in the board minutes, right? That we were, we, we got informed by these sources. Then you're, then you're fine. Typically, right. You have an informed decision, but if you just have a decision that uh, you, you can't come back of how it was, if it was debated or how it came to be, um, that really gets thin and murky, right? So that's something too I tell people like, you know, especially on stuff that's going to have controversy with it, talk and, and lawyers like, you know, will tell me this, but of course school lawyers might dodge this a little bit. They'll be, um, you know, they need to, to say, this is how we got to this point. Um, it doesn't have to be really long. It can literally be a sentence or two. You know, we, uh, we evaluated the CDC website on this page, our National Institute of Health, and, you know, we had a phone call with our uh, physician, right, at our local hospital or whatever. And, but, so I don't think people understand documentation and due process um, very well, right? And that's, it's just not where we're at. Um, there's an app, by the way, called Solocator. Yeah, I wrote about this in Velocity of Information. Joe Dolio uh, made me aware of it. And if you, so you're, if you're in any location, like you could take a picture of something and it will put down the coordinates of where that picture was taken, the time it was taken, all this metadata. And last year during the pandemic, when schools were having their custodians clean, you know, handles in, in, in the school, you know, door handles and tables and all this stuff, you know, um, to decrease the likelihood of virus on those areas. Um, I, I brought up to, so, so I would say to, to the, the new soups, the principals, well, how's this being done? You know, well, it's part of their job and, and they do this and do they sign off on it? Like a certain time they do it, you know, like in the back of a bathroom, you know, at a fleet farm, they have a time of like, yeah, this bathroom was checked and cleaned by whatever at this time. And I'm like, are you doing something like that? And they're like, well, no, not really. And I'm like, well, how do you, I mean, how do you really know that they're doing this or maybe they have other things that they're called to do and they're not getting to this because some kid just puked, right? And they, they got to pull the sawdust out. But, um, so this is, so I said, you know, if you had, for example, a solo cater app, um, then in the areas that they clean, they could take a picture and say, after they're done sanitizing it, boom, take a picture, it uploads. So you have the visual, you have the 
uh, metadata of where it was taken and when it was taken. So you could say, no, this was our process is to go around twice a day. Here's the picture from the morning. Here's the picture from the afternoon. And so like all of that makes sense. And, and to have this, that you can, can keep fidelity in a system, but people don't think that way. Like they don't. So, you know, when I bring that up, it seems like this super obvious I idea and it's like you're splitting the atom and I'm like, you know, not really. Right. This is something. And then, uh, you know, I will step it back a little bit further. And I said, this is something where your agencies or all your organizations that you're paying three, $5,000 a year to be a part of, Oh, we're a part of, you know, this group of school boards or whatever. I'm like, they should be coming out and telling you this. Like they should be, you know, giving you uh, guidance on these types of things. Like you shouldn't be hearing it necessarily from only from me or first time from me. And, and that's too where, you know, I think these organizations aren't, aren't helping um, to the level that they, they should, but you know, that, that totally makes sense, right? That the solo cater um, thing. And I don't know, I'm, but so what what else is happening here for die well i did the farmers market today and it um it rained it rained a little bit on and off today it was very short you know it would rain like very heavy for like 10 minutes and then like nothing for three hours but uh, the knife sharpening guy wasn't there today and he didn't have anything on his facebook page but in the past if it rains it's kind of a 50 50 because he has to plug in all of his stuff to knife sharpen <laughs> and so if it rains like he might not be there. So I have to go back next week because I have this this old hedge clippers. It's a heavy beast manual hedge clippers, really well made blades and stuff like that. But it's it's dull and I need him to sharpen that up. And thankfully, like it's just as a bolt, nut and bolt to screw it together. Not like it's stamped, you know, like the new ones with a um a rivet so you can't take it apart. I mean, this thing you can separate it in two pieces and but um Everything else was was great. Was able to score some more salsa. Um, found like this this vendor just perfect and like sugar free salsa stuff was great. Um, and yeah, we've got a a kind of a, like a food court event going on in our town on Saturday. And the <laughs> it's really I think they're trying to bring it back. You know, COVID was a knockout punch and they didn't have it for a couple of years, but one of the stands, and this is, this is actually printed in the paper. One of the stands. So they'll be like, this stand has a, you know, fish taco. And you know, this one has the, the whatever pretzel. And this one stand is the only thing listed is they're selling bottled water for $2. And I'm like, Whoa, like, I don't know if I would put a stand together for that. And it's not like it's uh, going to be a hundred degrees, but like you're selling bottled water. Like there's nothing else you can, can do to, I don't know. Um, we used to have though. It used to be just terrific food. There were a lot of uh, like local kind of rural caterers, you know, who would have their pull behind smoker to smoke a pig and stuff like that. And the two events and weddings and, and uh, so when we first moved here, you'd go there and there'd be long lines and all this stuff would just be, oh, just flavorful. And and, uh, and then like those small businesses are kind of gone, you know, because even before COVID, like a lot of them started to disappear, but COVID knocked them out because, right, you're, you can't make a go of that. So now, yeah, it is, it is uh, a pretty sparse listing, but yeah, the one just had, had water, like we're selling water. Like, I don't know about that. Like, what else could you come up with? Come on, think. Cookies? I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, we are selling water. So it is, it is two bucks. Um, I don't know. It's crazy. So uh, we, for the, the size of the town I live in, 10,000 people, um, we have a, a nice um, community performing arts center. And it's in a, a church that was originally built in 1855. Again, I live in the third oldest city in the state of Wisconsin. So a church built in 1855, which uh, about 30 years ago, it, it switched hands a few times and whatever, and, and um, was was bought and turned into this performing arts center. So 
it seats 290 and it's been totally reconfigured. So from outside, it looks like a church, but the inside, it's actually rotate 90 degrees and the stage and stuff like that. Um, but it it's always very popular. So they hold um, community theater, you know, that, that uh, you know, kids try out for and then, you know, or just the plays and stuff like that or bring in small bands and things like that. And it always sells out. Um, so it has a, quite a reputation and, and they've done some renovations. They've, they've added on to it a little bit for um, like a backstage area, but uh, pretty awesome. And they have like a really good sound system and all of that. And somebody who is a, in a band that performs like at large venues was telling me they performed here and they just said it's because it's you're so close to the audience, right? There's only the 280 people, 290 people there. It had a whole different vibe than if you're playing, you know, in front of like 5,000 people or, you know, 500 people spread out over a field, you know, and you're up on some uh, platform or something. They're like, it was just really cool and that they, they liked it. So, um, yeah, it's kind of, it's just a cool thing. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's good stuff. So I don't know if anybody is out there, but I, I did have a terrific show or a terrific interview I did with, um, on John Crump live, um, earlier today. So let me, uh, let me do this here and see if we can find it. So, um, Fine. I don't know. Um, give me just a second. Man, oh man, oh man, oh man, oh man. Um, okay. Me on John Chambers. John Crump live earlier today. Um, how new uh, laws will affect school safety. Um, all right, and there it is. Um, So, yeah, man. Um, all right. There's more people posting and that's getting views. It's good. It's good stuff. It's really good. It's really good. Um, so, yeah, that was me on um, John Crump Live. And for 60 minutes, like, there, there's a, a lot that's covered. Uh, like, and it's always puzzling to me that, we don't hear about this from, it's never on the news or your local news or um, I don't, I, I, you just, you don't even read about it really in the, um, in the newspaper, right? About the safer communities, the bipartisan safer communities bill and, and the impact it, it's going to have on schools or adult students. You know, just nobody really gets into it. So um I think there's there's big points there. I, I actually believe there'll be lawsuits coming out of that, especially with the access to student records. Um, and if I was, one of the things I would do right now as a school administrator right now is I would bring this to my, my board of education and say, you know, I am going to, th th this is a completely exposed flank for us, right? of if we have a student who, or a, one of our students could apply for a firearm, you know, legally a firearm permit. Um, and uh, there could be a background check and suddenly like we could, there could be a request for records from us. Um, so we need to consult our legal and throw, I mean, cause they, it's not the first time, you know, they've been aware of this. This is, this is working its way through the, the legal stuff, but, and, and, force them this is the other part when you work with school lawyers is they'll be like well here's like three options 
you could have like you're they'll leave you to make a decision right um in a lot of cases like this so um you know you could do these records but not these records or you could have them specifically do a time thing on the records or you could you know whatever but um like only going back two years or whatever but the the this is this is so crazy like how does this cross into FERPA and even HIPAA and um schools are very very protective with their records so what is really um what does this mean and so nobody knows that right so ask your school lawyer we want a position statement on you know if we are requested if there's a request for records like this is what we will give or this is what we won't and you know um so it's it's i and as i said i th i think the intent of this you know really has to be questioned are you trying to inform your decision about whether to grant a, a an 18 year old a permit to buy a gun um or you are you also trying to broaden your um the base of responsibility if something goes wrong like if if you're giving this out but then you're also saying oh like the school knew stuff and they didn't do enough right I, I, i'm what i'm saying is um this i i don't understand in in a lot of these instances the you know whether it be um well i mean students who have brought harm into school, the police already have been aware, like they've been contacted by the parents because of acts of violence that have been happening in the homes or threatening behavior or even by the school. Um, so this thing of kind of coming in and fishing through records is, is really murky, right? Um, and is there some access to special education records? Well, typically no, there wouldn't be, but, does this law, will someone interpret it? Or will there be someone demanding this? And if a school doesn't comply, I mean, what will be, how will this back and forth go? Um, because I would be like, I'm not giving you any records, right? Like this is outside of, um, you know, there are some things schools, if it's like a court and truancy, there's like some attendance and stuff like that. But I'm like, you're not getting a student's behavior record. You're not doing you know, if a parent agreed to it on a release of information and stuff like that, or the adult student agreed to it, well, that's different. But um, just coming in and harvesting this information, these records that they're typically schools do a very good job protecting these records. That's a no go. That's an absolute not. Um, so, I, if I were the school, school, and I think schools would do this, um, I would force that back into the courts and force it for a fact finder, a judge like to make a, a decision on it, right? Of saying, yeah, school, you have, because then, you know, and you can still say, we'll appeal it back. And schools, because this can quickly change to somebody looking at things who doesn't work in a school, who's not a psychiatrist or a psychologist or special education teacher, whatever, looking at it from a an alphabet agency side or a law enforcement side and subjectively saying, oh, it doesn't, it, it doesn't look like the school is doing what it needs to, to stop these behaviors from happening, right? This, maybe they gave records and student has been in four fights or, the, or something like that. Uh, I think there's this whole thing of, of it could be looking over and saying, we want the school to do more. All right. And I'm saying that as a school guy, because I, I just kind of see that, um, you know, schools are responsible for the immunizations, you know, happen in the school settings. Now parents will take their, I mean, just a regular polio and things like that. I mean, the, there, there could be this, this, I, I just don't see where schools um, come out in. I mean, here's the deal. Like they put this in and what they're trying to say is, oh, like we didn't have enough information for these students who brought harm onto their schools. I'm not going to give names, but um, you can look through, you know, um, and find that, you know, students had, um, so, so basically what they're trying to say is we could have acted sooner 
uh, agencies could have acted sooner, right? If we would have known more if this, if from the school. And we're asking the school with health information. We're just saying we don't have a system set up to get this information from those schools. So now what we're going to do is make this an option where we could get this information from schools in a background check if the student is trying to, to get a gun. Um, but like, whoa. So how are you, what, what are you using? If a student has a, a truancy, fine, right? Um, what does that fact, how does that factor into your decision or doesn't it? I mean, what is, and schools also do this thing and, and there's an article I wrote about it that's coming out, a major journal, it's a feature article. And I'll talk about more when it's actually the issue gets set um, of where it's gonna be, It'll either be November, December, but um, schools do something called an abeyance agreement. They started this, well, a long time ago, but it really got exacerbated after the 2014 Obama to your colleague letter to school saying, hey, like, knock off your suspensions, lower your suspensions number. So schools drop their suspension numbers. Everything looks good that way, except student behavior is not improving. Teachers will tell you that. Um, but discipline doesn't get recorded because of these, what it's called, abeyance agreements or suspended suspensions or pre-expulsions or all these things. Um, so they're not a part of law. Any, They're not a part of education law. They're part of criminal law, actually. Um, but they're not part of education law, but yet schools use them. Tucson School District uses, yeah, Andrew, obeyance. Tucson School District, I, I downloaded their handbook and like all their obeyance stuff. And I'm like, it's extremely laid out. Like, you know, if a student um, does whatever, you have to issue the abeyance offer. Um, and so those things never show up anywhere. So let's say that a school, uh, so a student was 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 wanting to to legally buy a, a gun and through the background check, um, the agency came to the school and said, we we want these records and their behavioral records. If the school used an abeyance agreement, let's say a student threatened somebody else or a uh, fight or you know whatever, um, if the school deployed an abeyance agreement or the sus suspended suspension, it doesn't exist. It's technically not anything in the legal books. So you're basically asking for a ghost. You're asking for something that is, is it, it happened, it's there, but there's no remnant of it, right? You can only, you know, you, you can sense it, but the, they don't have to comply. And, and we know that right now through open records requests, um, uh, people trying to get these things I've talked to who are studying this, trying to do legal notes of saying the schools won't comply because they'll say you're requesting something that doesn't, it's like area 51, right? It's like when you're staying outside and saying, I can see area 51, I can see the hangar, I can see the building. And they're like, no, it doesn't exist. And an abeyance agreement is that thing that schools use for discipline because uh, schools know if they report in suspension numbers, right? That they get dinged like on their school report cards, um, parents shop from school to school. So if you have a higher than your neighboring school, or like, you know, well, I'd rather go to that school. They don't have as many suspensions. Suspensions means this is a maybe a violent school, right? This impression. So there's a lot of reasons schools don't do suspensions anymore. I'm not saying suspensions are good or bad. I'm just saying they don't do it. But um, suspensions were reportable. So you could you could actually find that data. Like that was reported to the state and uh, you could, you could, to, uh, to segregate that down per like um, age and sex and race and disability, all of that. Abeyance agreement, none of that stuff. So it's basically this completely untraceable process that never is um, in a lasting document, right? It doesn't, after 90 days, it vanishes. So my thought on this is there's got to be a group of school administrators right now. There's got to be who are getting together and looking at this saying, we're not letting an outside agency come in and, and uh, dictate to us what records, you know, they take and whatever. So we're going to move more stuff to abeyance agreements. We're going to move more stuff off the books because we can't trust that they're going to correctly interpret it or that they're not going to try to pin whatever on us, you know, that we are the ones that are, you know, it's, it's not that the, Alphabet agency has come to that child's house a number of times or that they haven't followed through, I guess, quote unquote, follow through on a number of threats. Like they're, you know, they're, they're saying we're not going to give this information out because we feel it's like, it's like a doctor, you know, just giving out the, just, I mean, think of medical information. Like you, you just get, if you didn't have the context, well, here's like the lab results or whatever. And you're just giving it to someone who also isn't a doctor. So, 
you know, that's, I think, where the school has a really strong argument. And I think schools and their legal will start to come together. But yet, like this, schools are so different district to district. Like you will get some just schools who just aren't aware of this and they'll, they naturally are kind of compliers. Like they'll, they'll just comply or maybe a new soup. This is the soup's first job. They're not going to question it. So, and this is where, like I said, these organizations that the schools pay large amounts of money into, and I believe are oftentimes underrepresented and what these organizations do for them. But these organizations need to be looking out and seeing these things and communicating back to these school leaders and saying, Hey, like you got to be having these conversations and understand with your school lawyer. And we can give you some guidance here. Like, you know, we've got so many days of a, of a law, a lawyer consult, like you've got with us, maybe like, you know, one or two days are included in your three to $5,000 fee you pay. But um, I can tell you, the soups aren't ready for this. And the principals, they are not ready for this. They have, they have, most of them don't even know this is part of law. And by the way, school started. So again, and we'll use a football analogy. This is like the the kickoff to the game. And, you know, you've just feel at the kickoff. And now you're like, what do I do? Like, what are the rules to this game? Which way do I run? If I take a knee, does the whistle blow? And this, no one knows. Like, it's being invented as the game is being played. So to do this and not have the guidance out there is pretty wild. And this is a really invasive step, right? This is really a dangerous. What what happens if the agency gets the information and their information is hacked? Like what if it's a data breach? Oh, we just got your information and we got your students IEP individualized education plan. You know, they they receive services for um emotional behavioral disorder or autism and here's a letter to notify you those records may have been you know, obtained by an outside party during a data breach on whatever day. Then you're like, what? I mean, so, you know, this whole process of how do you, what safeguards will people put into place of how you even transfer data? And, but these are things which need to be thought out and then put in place, right? The problem here is you should have said, we are going to take X amount of time to figure out how to do this or have districts, you know, whatever, come up with their, and then at that point, this will go into effect. But it appears that it has gone into effect like right now. It appears like this has been passed and these, this is now an option, right? So, you know, what, what do you do? What do you do with this? So again, that's professional discretion. I mean, what if that, that call, uh, you know, your principal's calling you as a, as a soup and saying, I just got a request, you know, here at the high school and, you know, it's Wisconsin and, you know, deer hunting, um, you know, be in November. And, uh, you know, Billy um, apparently uh, is getting a, a new rifle, but we just got a request for his behavioral records, his attendance, his grades. His, and he was from the people conducting the background check. And um, they said, we have to do it per the law. Like, do we have to or what do we do? at least hopefully you'd get that call and so you'd have input to it and it would be informed, but, um, but that is crazy. So yeah, things boil down to, to discretion. They, you know, these, these huge bills, the, the things get passed, put into place. Nobody really knows what they are. Um, and you know, and also what is, uh, I don't like, I, I, I don't know. Um, it's, it's one of the things I've learned in doing tabletop exercises at all levels, including at major universities. Um, one of the things that I've learned from tabletop exercises is the first time through, it's usually pretty difficult for people. Um, and it's difficult because people aren't used to making decisions and having those decisions documented and in a, in a safety thing, like working as a group of like, you know, making decisions um, and then having injects like curveballs thrown in and, and then, you know, making the new decisions. Like they hesitate on making the decisions because they feel like I have to weigh more things before I, I make the decision. And um, I don't think that's I'm just trying to figure out here. Um, I don't, I don't. Uh, so anyway, and I experienced that in, in, the stuff that I run for tabletops. 
And I tell people up front, this is how you're going to feel. It's going to be kind of uncomfortable, but go ahead and make the decision. There's no right or wrong. You just have to make the decision. We'll go back then and analyze that when you made this decision, let's pause. Okay, let's think now. What other options might have been out there? What other, let's inventory your assets and then let's think. And maybe there were things that are out there that you didn't think about. You're like, oh, I should have thought about this. No, no, no. Don't say you should have thought about this. All we're doing is taking a pause. So it's simulated annealing. This process, again, we don't teach people. We don't teach educators. But what is simulated annealing? It's that you inventory your assets that you believe are available to you, right? And then you make a decision. It's hopefully get you in a better place. And then when you're there, you inventory your assets from that point. And your assets might change once you've moved to that other position. And then you make another decision, hopefully, to move you into a better place. So once you get to the second tabletop, people are thirsty for it. They're there and they're ready. And once you get beyond that, they they love these things. They're making decisions. They are welcoming going back and looking at their after action process of, okay, when you were here, like inventory your option. And you never are saying things like this was the wrong decision, right? You never say that. Um, again, it's laminated to context and time. Nobody's perfect in real time, but you come, you might come back and say, you know, let's try to let's take, take some time and inventory the options. What else, what else might've been on the table right here? Um, so, and people feel safe with that. People feel safe. And I wrote about it in school of errors, you know, people will embrace that people will make decisions. Um, and they'll feel much more confident about what they're doing. And, and yeah, so tabletop exercises are not done in schools very often. Um, and you know, you, you can find them on rems.ed.gov, the readiness and emergency site, which who knows if that'll even exist now that we have schoolsafety.gov, but all these different tabletops you can do. Uh, but yeah, lost the, the law student also makes a good tabletop, um, exercise, but I like to present it as I did earlier here where I, I'm really just getting you to say yes or no so I can measure your discretion. Like, so I know where you're at with this, how, how you perceive yourself. And it's not really there to solve the case study or, or to, to do this as a case study. Cause yeah, then we'd go in and say, how would you stage your assets? How would you verify who's with what, who becomes your ICS, your instant command? Um, how are you notifying people? Right. You'd go into all these things. That's not the part. That's not the purpose of this. Um, law student. The purpose is just to measure the person in charge, their discretion. Um, are they going to accept or not? And then kind of take it from there. Uh, so well, I'll leave the last uh, minute here. If anybody has questions for me, I will gladly uh, field them. Um, yeah, I, I need to, I'm down the the last, well, not really the last thing, but I need to edit my welcome to class video. I took all the footage for it. So I record like, here's the the part that's online, although the class is in person, but there's there's some stuff there. And here's like the syllabus and here's like me doing a welcome. And I usually try to get that down to like six, seven minutes. Um, but uh, what's a good business idea? Oh my goodness. So... I, I, yeah, I think electric bikes, right? Like if you could, like electric bikes or the electric bike battery business, I don't know. I think electric bikes are taking off. What's a good business idea? I, apparently you could sell water for $2 at our food festival here in town. Andrew, that'd be high profit, man. So, um, yeah, what is it? What's a good business idea? <laughs> so I, yeah, and, you know, in the school safety stuff, the the business really is not about what I'm talking about now. The sensible business is, yeah, that totally is logical and makes sense to do what I've talked about, discretion and tabletops. It's all about the hyper-realistic drills are back in full force. And... Um, fortifications are the other part. Uh, I've seen, yeah, the crazy, you know, multi-door lock systems and all of that stuff. And um, 
So that's that's where things things are at. Uh, people don't want to hear about the the other stuff. Um, so they they believe that safety is all in these hyper realistic drills or things you can kick like a bollard or see a camera or something like that. Um, so Americans hate to you know. Um, there was a there was an article in our paper, Andrew, a couple days ago, and it said uh, a couple bikes from um, whatever to Milwaukee here in Wisconsin on annual bike outing in record time. You know, I'm a cyclist, and I'm like, well, that's kind of interesting. So I read the article, and it's like they both used e-bikes, and I'm like, well, you know, well, good for you, right? But like, that's different than pedaling, and I can get if you're doing an uh, maybe an e-bike for work, like a, my neighbor uh, works 20 miles away and uh, uses e-bike to get there, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, but like part of what I do when I load up my bike and, you know, it's 20 pounds of, you know, water and gear is like, I, I want the workout of pedaling a bike, right? And you know, and I'm shifting through all of my, my gears and stuff like that when I bike. I mean, that's part of it too, is like I, that whole process. And, uh, I, I really just, I don't want to be out there, um, on an electric bike doing that trip. Like the, the trip is to, yeah, work out, feel the burn to, I, I don't know. I, but, but I think, I think e-bikes are going to just take off. And also I, I think at some point, um, you know, there's gotta, there needs to be, uh, yeah. I mean, they're unregistered, right? You don't have to register an e-bike as long as they don't go over 25 miles an hour. There's no special blinkers or lights or anything like that, that you need like that. That seems a little, um, a, a little loose to me. I'm not a big fan of regulation, but like when people bike, for example, you can bike when you're doing like kind of distance biking biking like me, like 12 to 14 miles an hour is probably typical. Um, like if you are biking as a competitive cyclist, like 22 miles an hour would really be cooking it. Like, um, so, but these bikes go like 25. I mean, that's, but, um, but yeah, I, I see people who I, I look at, I'm like, you should be bike. You should just be regular biking. You know, now if I'm, you know, I get older, uh, it's a medical condition and I'm like able to get out and, and, you know, do a little mix of, of pedaling and, and, uh, electric bike, you know, that'd, that'd be a cool thing. But like, I see young kids, I see young kids now in my neighborhood, you know, seven, eight, nine years old, and they're all out on these electric scooters. And so like we had the kid who I called the neighborhood Batman last year. I don't know where he's at. I haven't seen him since last year, but every, like I'd be out of my chair at the end of the day in my driveway. And this kid would come through on a scooter, a push, you know, foot scooter, right? So no motor. And he wore a cape. Uh, and I don't know. It was unaffiliated cape. I didn't see any logo on it. I don't know, but kid was maybe 10 and he had a cape and uh, he would come either up the road or down the road. And I live on a hill. So like going up the road, kudos, but, uh, uh, and like never said anything to him or anything like that, but he would go through it and I'd call him like the neighborhood Batman. Like this kid, like always came through, he was always checking stuff out. And I'm like, my God, that is the, uh, he is the uh, protector here of the neighborhood. He is the dark Knight, Um, our neighborhood Batman. Um, but yeah, I haven't seen him, but, uh, but Andrew's saying, you know, any, anything you can tax. Um, I would, I would say, I remember when we we got our first uh, all-terrain vehicle, a three-wheeler, when I was growing up, 1982, Honda 110. Um, at that time, you did not have to license those things uh, and anything. And within two, three years, you had to have a license, a sticker that you put on the gas tank on both sides every year. And, uh, and yeah, so I would, I would think the right there'll be a movement from politicians to, to, uh, tax, you know, the, the e-bikes, right. To tax to take the money. Um, so kind of, 
I'm just, I'm actually surprised it hasn't happened yet. I guess is, is, is my surprise knowing the environment we're in, right. Of, uh, of, you know, that we don't have a tax on, on e-bikes. Um, so yeah, other, other than that, man, I'll tell you the, the person who is booked out like crazy is we had concrete curbing put in landscape curbing around our house. Now, granted, like you have to have a pretty expensive piece of machinery to do this. And, but the guy that does that, so he's booked out now for two years and, uh, you know, you have to pay like, I don't know, like 70% down and then like 30% afterwards. And, and, you know, people aren't defaulting on this guy. Um, and as long as he can get his stuff in, I mean, he is, he's booked out. Um, so I think, uh, he does a absolutely great job, but they're, um, yeah. So, and you're not really having to deal with people too much, you know, maybe, but I don't know. I've been trying actually to get a concrete, uh, contractor to call me back because I've got some concrete work that needs to be done and no one's calling me back. So a couple of years ago when I first was kind of going down the slope, like people were right there, like quotes and all this stuff. And I should have moved on it then. But now when it's, you know, a little more pressing for some of this stuff, like there's no one out there. So I don't know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I am, uh, I'm enjoying the last, um, weeks of summer. You know, we start to hit this really, Wisconsin hits a pretty steep curve and the trees are already starting to turn colors and drop leaves, which is just, I don't like that. Um, I don't like winter. I don't like cold weather. Um, I don't like snow. There's none of it. So, and of course, that's exactly what we move into. Um, my biking season realistically will be done in six weeks. By the middle of October, um, you know, if if it's like 50 degrees, I'm not going to be out biking. And once the leaves start to fall, especially the country biking, I don't I don't really care for biking over where there's like leaves on the road and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so then uh, condition the bike and put it away until spring. It's kind of sad. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that, that is something I've been looking at saying, yeah, I kind of got six weeks. We really got, we have maybe three weeks of hot days left. Uh, you know, where you're, you could be above 75 and then it'll substantially start to curve, you know, into the sixties and fifty. Like we had a snowstorm two or three years ago on Halloween, a l actual snowstorm, like three, four inches of snow and 20 degrees and high winds. And so it quickly turns. Uh, so that makes, uh, that makes me uh, a little sad to see summer ending. Not, not I'm actually more than a little sad. I would, my perfect setup would be stay. My neighbors did this, you know, and then they officially just moved full time to Florida. But, um, you know, they would they would stay in Wisconsin till you know middle of October. Then it would go to Florida, and then they come back like April first or something like that. And to me, like that that would really work out. Um, but it's it's that thing of when you get into the Wisconsin winters. Um, you kind of get this multifaceted thing. Like you could have, you could have two or three weeks where it never gets above zero degrees. And in addition to that, it, it could be overcast each one of those days. Um, you know, I, and I remember when I bought my Buick LaCrosse in 2019, um, that there were days when I'd be out and it'd be, it start the morning, it'd be like 35 degrees below zero. I mean, it was nuts. And yeah, it is, it, that is really saps your motivation, right? Um, and again, being in the third oldest town in Wisconsin, we don't have a lot of sidewalks uh, because the older parts of town just never were built with sidewalks. And I don't know, I'm in, I'm in a moderately newer part of town and they weren't mandated to have sidewalks. I don't know. But so there's not like a lot of stuff you can, can kind of do. Like you don't want to be walking on the roads when it's, 
winter here because of just in town traffic and stuff like that. And, you know, I guess I could get a gym membership or something like that, but I'm not, uh, I don't know what I want to do is bike. So I wish I could go somewhere and for like a week and just like rent a bike in like a warm weather area, but also an area where there be uh, no crocodile or rattlesnake uh, come after me or water moccasin and, uh, you know, bike. So I haven't, I haven't figured that out. Um, but once we get into like March, well, daylight savings time in spring is usually my, my point one. And then I, I kind of like spark back to optimism because I'm like, whoa, it won't be long. I'll be out biking. And usually that's about the time I'll take my bike in for like a overhaul. Um, you know, for if, and so I can start to sense like I'm going to be doing these things and be out. And um, so, yeah, but, oh, and I absolutely hate dealing with leaves. So that is a, that is a mess. Um, I, yeah, I think I can maybe get the neighbor to do a sweep with our backyard with, he's got a, a big riding mower with a bagger. And if he would just do like the last 20 feet of our yard, it would probably cut my time in half. So I think he'd probably do that. So, all right. The um, School of Heirs is the most honest book ever written about the $3 billion school safety industry. This is out in paperback now. It's also an hard copy for 30 bucks. Paperback is 20 ebook. And it's also an audiobook. I narrated this. It came out August 1st. It is available in audiobook if you go on downpour, downpour.com. And there's other sites. It's $7.99. It's on Audible, but Audible charges you like $19 for it. Um, I don't know. That's but you can get it for $7.99 at downpour till the end of the month. It's six hours long, narrated by me. So School of Errors, and it's fun now because it's been it's it's really jumping in library count again. Um, cause I can see a lot of the, in my dashboard, a lot of libraries for my publisher where, it, where it's at across the world. And it took a pretty big jump just in the last couple of weeks. And in addition to that, the, uh, velocity of information, human thinking during chaotic times is showing up in more and more libraries across the world. So it's always fun. Like I'm like, Oh, it's in like Egypt, you're right. Or Israel. But, um, and this is, you know, when do people break their cognitive, um, capacity, during chaos. It's really, it's kind of a 90 days, but you know, we're going to go, I'm going to lead you through like, what's the science behind that. And a lot of terrific interviews in this book, Larry Lawton, America's biggest jewel thief. Um, you know, Hey, how'd you find out about nine 11? You know, you were in prison. Like, how did, how'd you find out about that? How'd you verify your information? Like what happened next? And, um, what, what happened when the prison shut down and lockdown and less information was coming in? Um, uh, Robert Travis uh, did two tours on Alaskan crab boats where all six of his bosses were killed on the boat. Nikolai Razvayu, um, Soviet uh, national cyclist who cycled the day after the Chernobyl disaster, cycled in Kiev. So, you know, this this is um, it's a phenomenal book of, of considering just the entire year of 2020 from pandemic to social unrest. Um, nothing out there like this. And I think it's, it's going to 471 end notes, but it really reads conversational, like an intelligent fireside chat. Um, there'll be things you totally forgot about that you'll read about in this book. Like right away, I have a story about Carl Mankey, the barber from Oswa, Michigan. And Carl, you know, was deemed non-essential. So he got up one day and his business was forced to close, but he kept cutting hair and eventually the state locked his doors and, and when the media would leave, they would unlock them so you could go back in. And But all of us were deemed essential or non-essential. What does that mean? And how easily could that happen down the road? So, and what do you do? Like, what's the best way to position yourself so you're resilient if you, you know, so you can have a remote career, right? Because um, if you were a dentist during the start of the pandemic, you were in really bad shape because your dental office was closed. You had no guidance on how to do dental procedures. Um, you know, if you were a, uh, therapist, mental health therapist, right. Who was doing stuff remotely or a CPA or something like that, where you, you could pivot quickly remotely, you were okay. But, um, but yeah, this whole essential, non-essential, uh, we, we get into a, a, a deep contemplation in there. Um, 
And, and that's really a book that I think over time is going to, the roots will go deeper as people look back to 2020 and, and what was written about this time. Um, that book is up for the, it's nominated for the S.I. Hayakawa Book Prize. And that also comes with a $1,000 um, stipend. So I will know uh, which book was was selected for that. Within, I think, three weeks, they'll be making their decision. So it could be Velocity of Information. Um, that's largely regarded as the m most important or most significant semantic uh, award that's out there. So semantic award, what is it? It's, it's the meaning of words, right? That you're writing something which is describing like a point in time, time binding, you're really giving attention, like so essential, non-essential, wet bulb, finite voltage, all these things. Um, trying to help people understand this terminology to describe events that they've been through. So that's semantics is meaning. And I also talked about like how dictionary entries like changed overnight, like preference, right? Like, so the book is really deep with semantics. And it, it would be awesome to get that award. Um, because uh, I have much respect for the Institute for General Semantics and also Esa Hayakawa um, taught in the in Wisconsin and actually at a college that I went to, although like he taught there in the 30s and I went there in the 90s. And then um, he graduated from UW-Madison and so did I. So there's some connections there. But Andrew's saying, am I back to weekly Monday night shows? Um, yeah, at some point. Um, I will. So I, I, that will be the night. I don't know if, when I will, the, 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 Andrew, quite frankly, like the hiccup on that for me is for me to stay, <coughs> excuse me, for me to stay consistent with, um, the way that I do my shows, which is the the blog post coming out a day or two after, and I usually do a blog post of 5,000 characters or 800 words. Um, so on safety PhD, all those are there and then rendering things in audio and then I level the audio, but that's all automated, but still it's time. So if I was to do this, you know, I'm not going to do a blog post for tonight, but um, I need to find a way to um, streamline my blog post, right. And how I prepare shows like in, um, and you know, thumbnails and stuff like that. So it's, it's all, it's not really the show. It's kind of all of the ingredients that go into what the safety doc has become because some of those shows, for example, um, are like the abeyance agreement show. Well, that might get referenced by people writing articles on abeyance agreement, or there are things in there, which if I do expert witness work, I could go back and say, Hey, like I, you know, I, have this show where I interviewed whatever, you know, and we talked about like this you know, person from um, ISS 24 seven on security notification systems. And we talked about how to consider them if people are visually impaired or whatever. But um, some of the stuff that I do I actually, you know, and it, and it becomes this body of work if it's on the website, right? Like that stuff is there for my public profile and the public work that I do. It's not as critical as it was in the past, but so, I mean, I just have to put time into thinking how I, I cogently write a blog post. So like happy, you know, can do five, seven shows a day, but he's not doing, he, he he'll do blog posts, a very thorough detailed blog post, but not for every show. Like he'll just, that's a separate thing that he has, but for me, it's, they're tied together. So, um, so again, this isn't podcasts, 184. This is another podcast on their safety doc, but it's not like one of the number ones. So that's where you got to think uh, uh, how I'm going to, to do that. Um, because right, I'm not paying anybody to do thumbnails like that. Somebody had put that out there and said, Hey, I could do like, you know, whatever show, you know, like $10 a thumbnail. I'm like, well, I appreciate that. But like the show doesn't make me any money. The show is a, is a negative cash flow because there's no advertising or no super chats yet. Um, but the show professionally is immense for me, even just to sit and to talk about my interpretation of some of the new legislation or to periodically have some guests on and, you know, to interview Preston Rice about drones. And so there, I mean, it, it, 
it ripples through the stuff I do at the university where I'm paid to teach classes, stuff like that. So it's really invaluable for me to stay current um, and and to to get input like today. And, and Andrew and, and, and people who follow the show that contribute in and longitudinally know what I do. Um, so I learned from you too. But it is, it's a thing where it's time, right? It's the time on the blog post. And so I, I go and... Uh, so I don't know, maybe, maybe if I cut my blog post down to, you know, to basically shorter, there's, that could be one of the things that I do. And, um, I mean, realistically, if I, if I got up earlier, <laughs> I could, uh, you know, on certain days I, I could, I could maybe get this stuff, but, um, so I don't, I don't know. Um, I guess my, my short answer to that is I don't know. And I, I also, I mean, I've done 183 shows, so it's not like I can't do this. And that I, I, I think I had two years straight where I had a show every week, but um, I need to, to figure out that. And I need to sit down really like in a Google doc and, and figure out what would be topics. Like there'll always be stuff that'll happen that then, you know, a couple of days later, maybe I want to do a show about, but what are, what are actual topics? Like it would be interesting to do a show, for example, on th there's two shows that I've been thinking about. One is the Nutty Putty Cave in outside Salt Lake in 2009, a cave, a guy went in there caving and he got stuck head first and they couldn't get him out in this and he died. Um, so to bring Atham Altiqua back on the show, you know, who's a caver and now is getting trained for cave rescue and say like, so what, are, what do you, what are some of the like strategies you use in these confined 10 by 18 inch spaces, 200 feet underground or like, um, are caves marked? Like, are there, so like, don't go down this area or like, how does this, how does this happen? Um, and, and I mean, just kind of a specialty thing. And, I think it would be interesting to do for me to do some research on that uh, chip implant for kids in California, like 15 years ago. I'd have to find that again, um, and to say, hey, like, do you know that kids were chipped for school safety? Um, and maybe to to try to find some of these more um, in, in people to interview, right? That would would be able to add. Their perspective. Like I thought when I interviewed, um, you know, Lee, Lee Jarvis was on the show and Lee was talking about intellectual property at a time when the case act came out like, a, I don't know, a year ago or a little longer than that. The case act is a copyright act and all that, but, but Lee, you know, was really into this stuff. He knows this well. And he was talking about, well, here's, here's different ways to look at this stuff. And then also, um, you know, we were getting into the discussion of what happens with 3d printing, right? If, you know, someone claims that whatever you made was copyrighted, but, you know, do you have to go in and do a copyright search, which I think is $250 minimum um, on the government site before you would make something or what if, I mean, but so there were questions that he had this great area of expertise and was able to lend to that. And, and, you know, Clay Martin, Larry Lawton. So I need to also um, invite more people on his guest and flying rich. I want to have back. So flying rich, we were talking about 3d printing during disasters. And I've thought much more about that and coming in and, and saying, you know, like how many people, what would a team look like? Like how much of different like 3d printing materials? What, what are 10 things you could 3d print um, catheters? Right. And I mean, we kind of got into some of this, but like now with a little more science behind it, like, right. Look in some of these things and, and uh, how we how this could change? Like now, there's a drone. Like there's a drone. Lifeguards have a have, some lifeguards have a drone that can come out and deliver a, a safety buoy, uh, right? Uh, to to people. And so there's questions of you know, does is that good or is that bad? And lifeguards are saying, well, you know, we use wave runners like out in California. We never use those until the technology was there. But um, so. I think though, like I can analyze some of these things, but it would be great if I could find and get some people out there who, you know, were experts in this area or closer to it. Like I had Josh, a locksmith on, he had contacted me and he said, Hey, like I'm, 
I follow your show and stuff, and I'd like to, to let people know a little bit about uh, locks and security. And so I thought that was a great show, right? So, Andrew, it's, it's going to take a little more commitment on my part to uh, to do that, to find, you know, who I want on as, as who I'll try to approach as, to come on as guest. And then also how I can kind of streamline the uh, the stuff that goes up on, on the the website. Um, so, yeah. And right now, I mean, frankly, summer's a summer's a difficult time for me to do anything that is not um, me being outside, right? I mean, it's we it just is. It's only half the year here where it's you know warm and sunny, and then half the year it's completely opposite that. So, if I am inside you know, prepping a show and doing all of that, or like someone says, Oh, I can do like an, like I have someone who I'm going to interview on esports, but they're like, I can know I'm available after 11 o'clock until like two in the afternoon, like during whatever I'm like, okay. But <laughs> like I look at my calendar. I'm like, each of these days is going to be like 80 and sunny like next week. So I'm like, I don't do like, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to, because that would nuke my outing. Like I wouldn't be able to do that. Um, so I want to have you on and maybe I'll have to record it and like not do it live or whatever, but, um, you know, the, the, the esports, the head of the esports in the, the state, like, I absolutely, I want to do that. Um, but I, I'm not going to burn a day. That's one thing I did when I, when I ended my consulting, um, largely my consulting business, I was doing a lot of stuff with California up until like uh, two years ago. And, and I just said, I don't want to do this anymore because it's eating too much of my time. Like they just wanted more and more and more time. And once the weather got good, like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be, I, I don't want to be consulting, you know, like Aaron Claire is like, Hey, my office today, you know, it's some, some mountain range or whatever. And that's really what I wanted to be doing. I want to be out biking or working my yard or, or taking a jog or even taking like a seven, eight mile walk or a hike. And that's what I do. So Andrew is offering, he's saying, I'd be a guest or I'll be a guest when I start my YouTube channel. Uh, well, cool. Yeah. And uh, I know some of your your background and interests. So I think that those are, we could form a great show with with that. So, um, so yeah, I think, um, and I, I had a, you know, a kind of my, my first maybe like 50 shows, maybe 30 of those were interviews. Like I think my, third or fourth show that I did. I had a, a search and rescue, uh, a lady who was on a search and rescue team who had a, a dog, Sierra. And the, the whole thing, you know, was like, well, what happens? Like you get a call and you could be at work and she's like, yep. And then, you know, I got to let them know. And then I have to, um, you know, go to go home and we have a go bag, but then there's other things to get ready. And so like, what's the time on that? How long does it take? And once you get there and then other things, she said like the dog only, can only operate for so long in there that you have to reset their, their sense of smell. So you have to like bring an item back to them or, and there's, you know, like pollen messes with things. Like if you're going through cornfields, she's like, that doesn't work very well. And I mean, stuff you don't kind of know. And then how do you work with other, other teams and how do you know you haven't gone over an area where, five other people haven't gone over already. So, but that was a fascinating uh, show. So I, th I, I think those type of things, and actually that one I did where I was out with Preston Rice is two shows. He was showing me drones and how, you know, to use them for like rescue and stuff like that. And so we were out on a field and he was, he was using these things. And we were just talking the other day and he said, Oh my God, like this stuff has advanced so much from then. Like, you know, the stuff that is out there now, the technology, the high definition camera, the speed, the ability to operate in adverse weather to, um, you know, it's, it's just so different battery life and all of that stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I think all of those things. So I don't, I have to, I guess I need to, to think I have some constructs like, or themes of the show, like policy, right? So I do some shows that are just on policy stuff. I have schools on like air drills, safety drills, stuff like that. Um, school communications. Um, so, you know, I guess I need to to really sit down and kind of game plan. What, what do I want to do for like the next 12 shows? 
and really kind of rough rough those out and and take it from there like this that's probably what i was doing early on when i started the safety dock and then um i got away i got away from that um but that actually did work pretty well to sit down and say yeah let me do i'm gonna kind of game plan a dozen things and if there's something that comes in between some you know near miss meteor event or something like that uh, i can i can pivot over to that um so yeah i don't i don't know isn't it kind of funny like how, how people just have shows like who would have thought you could be back you know years ago um you know 20 years ago if you told someone oh yeah like you know you and you know a lot of people you know will actually have like a, a television show that that'll be on the internet that anyone can access at any time in real time or like afterwards it'd be crazy to tell people that right and yet like and look at the people who go in and have made like get their careers um and i'm not, and i'm saying there's a difference between entertainment and then also like uh, informing like the people like the the people that do channels um like chris fix you know like here's a channel on how to do a change of brakes on your car right and he's got all the parts and the steps and you get everything laid out and his lighting and all the edits and stuff like that. So, and you know, you might get 3 million views on a video. Here's how to change your, your brake pads. So it's really like an, what an amazing gift of knowledge to have and someone putting in this level. And that the, the fact that people inherently look at this stuff and they rate it as valuable or not valuable. Like he has to do, um, the content has to be good, right? Or it's, it's not going to get viewed. It's not going to keep people's attention or they're going to leave comments that'll be critical or so so we do have this kind of amazing thing that's happened that we just also take take for granted but but yeah um and in school safety frankly i need to i need to determine um if i'm going to to kind of stay more the school of errors my perspective of being more critical and more challenging i think that's needed i think a lot of people can't do that because they're beholden to you know uh, a contract with a school district or you know so, something else that that is really preventing them from speaking candidly um you know that i can do that without um having to measure my words because oh my my boss is going to call me in um you know because i criticized uh you know whatever on safety drills uh so so yeah i think um I think it's coming up with with kind of a game plan and re reinventing um, some of the not reinventing, but just kind of coming up of what I what I want to do. I used to do sixty minute shows, like my first hundred shows are all sixty minutes, and the reason is I was syndicated on the four hundred five media in Los Angeles. Now the four hundred five was a big deal back when I started my show. Like that was basically um, a podcast radio station run by John Grant. And they had, I mean, there were really big time shows on there. And somehow when I started the safety dock out, there was like a three in the morning show, right? That was leaving that had been with them forever. Um, and John offered that slot to me and he said that you have to do a show. And then I had like all the stuff like with his, I had to go in and do like a post and all this stuff and graphics and, and, uh, and then, but it was getting then I get a lot of exposure, right? Like that, I was getting tons of downloads and and the shows all over the place, um, and surrounded. Like Aaron was on, Aaron Clary was on, I think before me when I got moved to a better time slot. But then the four hundred five media um, basically kind of dissolved, um, you know, a couple of years ago, and and it got real uh, real edgy too, like on kind of the, some of the political things. So it just wasn't a great fit. Um, so you know, I I stopped putting my stuff on the four hundred five. And again, I don't think it exists today anymore, but that's why everything was an hour because the 405 was a one hour show. Um, so you could, it didn't make sense to go over an hour. It'd be kind of weird. And that was my main viewership and, and my main listeners. And like with John Crump show today, I mean, we were just a tad over an hour. And so like, you know, my best content really is probably going to be an hour or maybe just a tad over. Um, but, uh, so these type of shows, like these will be one listen shows unless someone is commuting or someone's working on their house and they want to download something that's going to eat up a lot of time. Like when I bike, I'll download long podcasts of people a couple hours long because I know I don't have to keep shifting out of different podcasts, right? 
Um, so that's something too of saying, you know, if I do, if I come back to that Monday and I think I had a good formula with face validity Fridays, I think that was good, but I think I could move that into Monday if I had something where it was like one hour and part of that included like a face validity article. And, um, I think there's some ways that I could kind of shift to, to cover a lot more in less time. So I know you can get more views that go in fresh and fit. Yeah. I can't imagine any scenario where Fresh and Fit would would um, have me on. <laughs> so I've seen. I'm just like, like how uh, right? How would that match? How would that con how would that content match? I could I could never keep up with those guys. So and uh, yeah, but so so that's part of it too. And I I also thought about well, do I record the shows ahead of time and not and then come back for the do a premiere. So like US Battleship US New Jersey, USS New Jersey, right? That's how they do it. They record and then they do a premiere. So every so if I did that, I could have more graphics, I could control things. Um, but doing it live, I don't really have that interface. But like the reality is live streams tend to draw people in. Um, so I I think if I abandon my live streams, it would really it, it would hurt me. Um, I think it's just evolved to that point. Um, every once in a while, like a few, a few shows ago, I released a one hour that was a premiere. And the reason I did that is because otherwise I forget how to do them. I don't know how to use my editing software and, you know, to cut in the intros and I don't even know where the, all the stuff is, you know, I kind of know, but, um, I, that's why I needed to do that one hour premiere because I just needed to, oh yeah, here's how I add this in and here's how I add my edit. You know, here's how I edit clips together and, um, you know, make sure I do once in a while, get some of the safety doc commercial, the book commercials in there. So if people are listening to, uh, three or four of my shows, you know, they're going to hear some of the commercials and stuff like that, um, to promote my stuff. But I don't know I'm open to ideas. So if you want to send any over, those are, those are all great. I mean, even like ideas, I mean, um, somebody, you know, if you, you want to send something and say, Hey, like this would be a, a great show. Larry Lawton, America's biggest jewel thief. I contacted Larry a couple weeks ago, two, three weeks ago. And I said, you know, Larry, I think, I think a show on how does money work in prison? Like, because, um, you know, what is like currency stamps are currency, but then how does like your commissary work? And if you get transferred to another prison, does that follow you? And when you leave prison, do you get to take it with you? And so he's, so he did a show on that and it was, it was very popular. Um, so, and then people down in the, in the comments were asking all these additional questions of, of uh, the stuff. And I never knew, like he did some research on it and he said, you know, there were, there were prisons back until like the eighties would give you prison tokens. It would have the prison on it and it'd be worth like a dollar, but it was just like a logo of the prison. I didn't know that. And, um, and then after, once you leave prison, you, you, anything that you have has to stay there. Like your, your commissary gets cashed back into the prison. There was something with that, like, um, and only so much you can take out with you, like forty dollars or something. But uh, by the it was is a fascinating show, right? And these people had questions, but um, so that's where I, I I would love to interview somebody who would have be an environmental specialist, like right now, because I I think people are kind of wouldn't answer this before, but to say when you come into a school, um, could you test for the virus, and how would you do that? How could you, how long would it take and all this stuff? And, uh, you know, what places would you test? I mean, that'd be interesting. Like that stuff, everybody has a question about, uh, and, and no one has an answer. And even like to interview someone on HVAC now, like someone isn't just going to give you their time. Although I know some HVAC people, but who might, uh, and just say, you know, like how, how much air gets circulated in a school in a day. Right. And what's the impact of having windows open or closed or like the filters or like, how does, what would you really have to do to decrease stuff would you need like a merv 13 filter and if so like would that burn out motors or like how, how much does that cost i mean just things and people be like well you know what yeah like our school year um you would have to do this whole like series of furnace filters and um 
I don't know. I think things like that would be kind of a quirk interest area. Andrew's saying, hey, if I do live streams, they'll be on a Sunday night. Seems to be an off night for many. So yeah, there's there's one YouTuber. Um, I catch his Sunday night shows. He's out in Pennsylvania. Uh, he does uh, like railroads and stuff like that he goes to. and But that's more like his question and answer time. But yeah, that's pretty... You know, Sunday would be another time. I'm not trying to take a time to compete with you, but I think it was either Sunday or Monday, but I, I kind of like the Monday slot. Um, so I don't know. I'm not ending the show. I'm, I'm, I'm not, but um, the show initially was just something I wanted to see if I could do. Um, and then I was, and I stuck with it, and I learned, you know, and a lot of uh, help from Hector Solis early on from Crime Wave Podcast helped me out with uh, how to do, you know, what software to use, stuff like that. Um, and then once I moved on from from that, then I really started to use it to build my skill set for like expert witness work. So uh, I could learn more about things. And if you interviewed people, right, you had some expertise in these areas, you could make this argument. So it was really a way to kind of turn yourself into this micro expert in a lot of areas was to like do blog posts and interview and do research. And, and that worked very well. That was a good strategy for me, but now that's not where I'm at. I don't do that. And so now it's really, I want to do things that probably expand my university work so I can like pull from the podcast and bring it into the stuff I do at the university. So if there's reasons for me to research certain things like esports is going to be a podcast. I'm going to have somebody on because I want to know what policy looks like in schools for esports. And that's a question for my new school administrators. Like, what is your policy? Is it the same for extracurriculars for traditional athletics? Um, how do you, how are you budgeting, you know, for, for East, what, what credits do you give for esports? What is, how, how do you adapt equipment for esports, right? If you're in a wheelchair, you're not playing football because to make the you, you'd have to adapt the game so much that it, it would change the game there's rules and cuts and criteria stuff but like if you're in a wheelchair and you're you're on a esports team that's a different thing like or maybe if, you know if you have some uh you know some nerve um issue or whatever maybe it's changing modifying a controller or something dampening on a controller i mean there's all these things people are going to have to think about and actually, I think they're really, this is a great, I mean, I think this is, esports is just awesome, opening up so much opportunity. Um, but I, I also think like it's so new, people aren't kind of thinking about some of these other areas. Like what does it look like from Board of Education policy and stuff? So um, so that's where, yeah, I've, I've already made some connections. And so, well, guys, it is 1244 in the morning here. So I'm going to go to bed. This is, I didn't expect to do this, but after I was on John's show, I was really fired up. It was a great show, and I wanted to carry that over into this one. So thanks for the watch hours. By the way, thanks for smashing the thumbs up. Um, very much appreciate that and all that goes with it. So this is uh, your your good friend, uh, Doc. Uh, and uh, Andrew, take care, buddy. And um, I am going to uh, lead us out here with a uh, commercial. So take care. As chaos erupts, torrents of conflicting yet urgent messages gush from media outlets. What is the magnitude of the incident, and what should people do to protect themselves? Dr. David P. Perodin teaches you how to prevent mental burnout by observing indicators and building a robust member check network. Reporter James David Dixon of the Detroit News proclaims, the velocity of information will empower its readers. Drawing on current events, history, interviews, and scholarship, the velocity of information is an education in the way people react and adapt to change in this fast-spinning world. Never has it been more important to sift facts and stories for truth and meaning. There are teachable moments on every page. By the Velocity of Information, Human Thinking During Chaotic Times. Available from your favorite bookstore or online retailer.